Good morning. Good morning. It's Thursday. It's March 21st, 2024. Today, we finally have updates in the Corey Richens case, which has been a minute. Stuff's been under seal and they've been fighting over things under seal, but something got unsealed and you might have seen the headlines. If you didn't, no spoilers, because this case has been wild since before the walk the dog letter the walk the dog letter took this case up a notch don't worry we'll do a road so far for those of you new to the Corey richens case but now law enforcement's questioning how much her mom was involved so i don't know are we going to end up seeing Corey richens mom in the same position that we're seeing i don't know charlie adelson's mom in i don't know you're gonna have to tell me but we're going through the whole unsealed warrant today what we're not going to do is be like in documents obtained by me it said this one little thing no no we're going through the entire thing we also are going to cover the hearing in idaho that i missed or that we missed together when i was covering the trial in new mexico for hannah gutierrez there was a about an hour long hearing um in idaho We've got some new information, we've got some new dates, but I think it's important to see what these attorneys are saying and what's going on in court because we always learn more. So we're gonna go to that Idaho hearing and some of the new things that have happened in that case. And I think that's going to probably fill up quite a bit of our time, but if it doesn't, I have a few other extras that we can maybe maybe get into if we have time. Otherwise, that's gonna have to be um that's gonna have to be another stream i was gonna do a summary stream today and then this stuff popped off in the richens case at the end of a very long stream on tuesday and i started seeing it pop up in the chat and i was like oh we have to do that if i can get the documents and i did so that's what we're gonna do so lonards buckle up um the Corey richens case is just gonna feel like we're gossiping about people that live in our community like this feels like grocery store gossip it's all in this search warrant so i i can't wait to hear what you guys think we just we need to process it together hey there i'm emily d baker the internet's go-to legal analyst breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about i'm a big fan of the cursey words i've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years but this is not legal advice this is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts not <laughs> let's get into it sometimes legal documents are more gossipy and sometimes legal documents are less gossipy it just depends on the particular legal document doesn't it tina ks loner thank you so much for the 20 gifted memberships that's incredibly kind to all of the members um who were on the members live last night what happens on members only stays on members only. we had um we had quite a time last night for about three hours we read some astrology you can call it that um things happened we talked about um my friend and and uh and partner manager over at youtube reed <laughs> the law nerds were so welcoming you may or may not see him pop around the chat on different days but we had a very nice time um and and talked about all of all of the things i it was it was like a wandering emily what do you plan to talk about on members only well everything and that's exactly what happened everything y'all learned quite a bit about what i was like in high school so uh that i blame on rob from law and lumber because he asked the question that prompted the whole situation thank you so much for the super chat much much appreciated it we thank you that's that's absolutely incredibly generous um and I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So we had we had a, a, a good time. So if you need the replay and you are on um, our members, our member spaces off the YouTube platform, that'll be up for you this afternoon. If you're here on platform, it'll be there. It's just, it's just. You guys let me know where you're coming in from, what you're drinking. I have, of course, the dragon mug with a cup of cappuccino um, that I made for myself. I'm going to try to do a quick road so far on this, um, and we'll go from there. Let's see. Have I seen the Karen Hooger uh, DUI? I have seen it. I don't know if there's much to cover. I've also seen that she has like a previous uh, DUI. I don't know if that's within the last 10 years or if that's outside of the last 10 years. But yes, I saw it. Right now, there's not a ton to um, a ton to cover. J. Michael, good to see you. And you're coming in from, from Walt Disney World, which is amazing. 
So yes, I saw it. I don't know if there's much to cover. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Ginger Ninja. No. 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 I'm going to try to compose myself and um, give you a road so far on the Corey Richens case. Uh, let me put up a poll real quick. I want to find out how many of you are have followed this case with me. I know some of you are new from the last trial, and it's been a minute since we've covered this. Um, so have you been following uh, Richens? I swear, the thing about Utah cases is their court document system is a little bit more challenging. So let's do a quick road so far on the Corey Richens case for those of you that aren't familiar. Did I have my other notes pulled up? Yes. Do I know where they went? No. Is that fine? Yes. Are we going to have dates? Not until we get into the search warrant. So Corey Richens is a Utah mom who was working as a realtor when her husband um, died seemingly overnight in his sleep. It was later determined that he died from an overdose of fentanyl and almost a year or a little over a year after his death, she was charged with his murder. Shortly after he passed away, the family, his family, her in-laws came to the house to collect some of his things and to um, get into a safe because he had changed his will and he had changed the executor of his estate to his sister corey richen punched her sister-in-law amongst other things when the sister-in-law came over to like empty out uh his gun safe and some other things because they had become the executors of the estate unbeknownst to corey she didn't know that everything he had wasn't going to her at the time of his death she was charged with a misdemeanor for that assault that has just been recently back in court as well we haven't talked about it a ton but in between the time of the death and the assault of the sister-in-law in the garage and the arrest for the murder she wrote a children's book about grief and was in the middle of promoting that children's book about grief when she was arrested for her husband's murder so she has since been accused of his murder of poisoning him with fentanyl he had a um, substantial amount four or five times um a lethal dose in his system and when police um went to the home to respond to a unresponsive person there was no indicia of of narcotic use near him so normally when you see um, an OD, you will see what the person had been taking if it's an accidental overdose. None of that was there. It's wild. And then, and then while she was in custody, she was writing a letter um, that she says is a novel. Yes, I'm using air quotes liberally because the walk the dog letter seems to say to her mother and brother that they need to get their stories straight and they need to remember that Eric had spent time in Mexico and he was always like doing drugs in Mexico with his friends. And, and then it's about her being in prison, but it's really fictional, wild. So some of that stuff has just gotten turned over as well from the, um, from the defense attorneys to the prosecution because apparently the walk the dog letter is part of a larger transcript. Some of that has been ruled attorney client privileged documents that the prosecution's not gonna get, but there's a second letter that the prosecution is getting. And then we cr covered this crazy transcript of a phone call with her brother. This case is absolutely wild. So most things have been going on under seal and there haven't been any new court hearings until the media started reporting this unsealed search warrant. This unsealed search warrant, I saw a couple headlines because law nerds are bay. And you guys started hitting up my DMs and email immediately. And you're like, girl, did you see this? And I responded to some of you, oh my God, what? Have to cover it immediately. So after that i started searching for this document so i didn't have to go off of reporting going off of reporting is not my favorite way to do it though local reporting in utah through ksl has been actually i think very very good so we have the whole search warrant we're going to go through it all ourselves we're going to talk about this misdemeanor case just a little bit and the hearings that have since been scheduled 
But everything in this case, like Idaho, it's like motion, motion to seal, seal granted, motion, motion to seal, seal granted. And so I'm looking at all this stuff happening. I'm like, hey, can you please tell us more about what's going on in this case? And then this popped up. And now I'm very excited to cover this. B2 has been making it rain memberships in the chat, which means everyone's going to know. The entire chat is going to know. <laughs> the entire chat is going to know the things that happened on last night's members only live. <laughs> Thanks to B2. That's incredibly generous. That's like 60 memberships, B2. Thank you so much. The Lawnard community, you're like the literally the fairy godmother of the Lawnard community, just like making it rain memberships on every single live stream. But you know, you know who else is kind of making it rain a little bit? We have a stream sponsor. So before we jump into this misdemeanor and before we jump into the warrant, we are going to take a minute to thank our stream sponsors. If you um if you were on last night's members only stream, you know how important our sponsors are to us and how frequently our streams are not advertiser friendly because of things that are said in court and how I had a conversation with my partner manager about what happened in the Rust trial of Hannah Gutierrez because it wasn't the name of her phone that got me, but it was um her calling her coworker a see you next Tuesday that absolutely got me during that trial and I had forgotten that that was even said. So our sponsors really do make a huge difference on this channel, just like our members do. So a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Love and Pies. A huge thank you to Love and Pies for sponsoring this stream. Lonard, I know how much you love this game. I love it too. I know that a good number of you are playing it while I'm talking right now. Love and Pies is a casual merge game for iOS and Android where you build your own cafe, but you're also following a really fun storyline with a ton of diverse characters and there's fun little sub games within the game. I love the toy building one the best. It's so much fun. So you have side quests within your main game and little competitions as well. I know some of you are days ahead of me in Love and Pies, but it's been so fun to build out my little cafe. I wanna know what color way you guys normally choose. I always fluctuate between the pink and blue decorations. So now my cafe is like a, rustic retro mix and i absolutely love it love and pies is absolutely free to download and a ton of fun to play whether you're unwinding listening to a podcast or following the latest trial don't forget to download love and pies today use the link down below and let me know what day you're on if you're already playing thank you again love and pies for sponsoring this video let's get back to today's stream you guys, I don't mind at all that you're doing different stuff while you listen to the streams. I try to make sure that if I pull anything up on scream, scream, on stream, I describe it so that for those of you that are listening while you're doing all of the things you're doing in life, you don't feel like you're missing something. The only time I catch myself on that is if I respond to a um, super chat or respond to a comment and don't pull it up. And then I'm like, ah, because then you're listening and all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, yeah, I agree. And you're like, agree to what? <laughs> so I always try to make sure that I loop you in when you are listening in the background. Because I know a lot of you are just like, Emily, you're just in my ear while I'm working, crafting, doing laundry, driving, whatever it is. So I try to make sure if you're not looking at the screen, you don't miss out on something that is something that when I listen, because I listen to almost everything in the background, and um then it's like a, a whole conversation's happening and i'm like wait what started that conversation i missed it i have to go back let's talk real quick about this misdemeanor case with corey richens and what's going on i had absolutely forgotten this happened because like the walk the dog letter and the the transcript with her brother here we're gonna put this on reader mode and the transcript with her brother were so wild that this completely escaped my brain so this is coming to us from ksl judge schedules hearing in corey richens assault case corey richens a woman charged with murdering her husband appeared virtually from jail tuesday that's this week tuesday that's like two days ago tuesday that's like the march 19th tuesday in the Summit County Justice Court to address prosecutors' claims that she did not follow through with the terms of her plea in a separate domestic violence case. It is considered domestic violence because they are um, because they are relational. It is her sister-in-law. So in 
Utah, they charge that as a domestic violence assault because there is a relational component different than somebody punching a stranger, you know, on the street or in a bar or whatever. Richens 33 was charged with assault, a class B misdemeanor on June 9th, 2022. The incident cited in the charges happened three days after her husband's death in March, 2022. Richens' sister-in-law, Amy Richens, and this is why I can't go by last names because everybody's last name is Richens, and it gets really confusing when you're like, Richens punched Richens after Richens passed away. It's, what? So. Amy Richens testified that she went to the home of her brother, Eric Richens, shortly, shortly after he died and discovered that Corey had hired a locksmith to break into Eric Richens' safe. What did she think was in the safe? And also, if you watched the detention hearing on this case with me i'm pretty sure we have a playlist if we don't i'll get there um the sister testified about this whole incident and as we were getting into the detention hearing i sat there like with my mouth agape i was like what now what what now and in the detention hearing they went through all of the financials they went through corey richens google searches do you remember the google searches like luxury prisons for rich people and shit. Yeah. So they went through her her Google searches. They went through how in debt she was. They went through how she was over leveraged buying houses. They went through how much money he had in his business. And the fact that he had told people that he was worried she was trying to poison him and then changed his will. And that's where his sisters became the executor of his estate. So the sister shows up after the death and Corey's trying to break in to Eric's safe. She asked her sister-in-law why she hadn't asked her father-in-law. So the deceased victim's sister asked the defendant why she didn't ask the father-in-law for the code. And Corey's response was screaming and telling Amy to get out of her house. She said she was punched in the face and in the neck by Corey, which if you want to hear the whole rundown of that, it's in the detention hearing. Quote, I will never forget the look in her eyes when she attacked me that Sunday morning. It took four people to pull her off me that day, Amy Richens testified. Corey Richens pleaded no contest to the charge on February 14th, 2023, as part of a plea in abeyance. We're going to talk about that in a second. And was given 90 days to complete a thinking errors class. Utah. Utah? The, the name of this class is sending me. <laughs> Not... In, in LA, maybe it's changed, but in LA it was like anger management. <laughs> but the fact that the class is called thinking errors, it's just, I mean, can we... <laughs> so think the thinking errors class or grief counseling um, until, and she had until January 14th, 2024 to complete that and pay a thousand dollar plus fine to the court. A plea in abeyance means if you do these things, then your misdemeanor will get dismissed. Like you're pleading now, but you're not sentenced. So it's not like on your record yet. You're pleading, you have to do the things. And after you do the things, it goes away. Not uncommon in misdemeanor cases, not uncommon in first offender cases, um, not an uncommon type of a plea deal. Like, hey, things got real crazy and heated on this day. We're gonna need you to, to chill out and not do that anymore. But we also are gonna give you a, uh, we're gonna give you a chance to, I guess, address your thinking errors. <laughs> thinking it was a good idea to punch your sister-in-law was an error, ma'am, amongst, amongst other alleged errors. Deputy Summit County Attorney, getting back to this article, Bradley Bloodworth said, Richens has not completed either the, of the requirements but Summit County Justice Court Judge uh, Brendan McCullough said the payment would have been put on hold since she was incarcerated for the murder. You don't have to pay the fine on the other case when you are you know, in jail, but you do have to do the classes. And generally you can do classes while you are in custody. Because she has entered a plea as a plea in advance, the charge will be dismissed if the court determines she has followed the terms. If not, she will be convicted of the misdemeanor which wouldn't really come up in the murder case anyway, but it it might make her salty that she's convicted of the misdemeanor for assaulting her sister-in-law, maybe. 
Defense attorney Sky Lazaro assured the judge that Richens did complete grief counseling. She opted for the grief, grief counseling, not the thinking errors. She's like, no, I was thinking clearly. I, I, I was thinking very clearly. Um, I could, after reading the walk the dog letter, I can just picture her being, no, no, like she needed to be punched. I can see it happening. So she submitted the grief or did the grief counseling, but did not get a report. Any of you who have ever worked in a court setting, this, the, the amount of times people said this to me is all. DUI classes, anger management classes, um, AA sessions, NA set like the amount of time it was like, oh no, no, I totally did 200 hours of community service. I just forgot to get it signed off. N Stop. But it happens a lot. Sometimes it's genuine that people don't get reports. I try to give grace, but this is a very common, um, we did it. We just, we just don't have the paperwork. Oops, our bad. It goes on to say a week before the deadline to submit the report, she was charged with murdering her husband and taken into custody. That seemed to come as a surprise to her, even though she had been emailing back and forth with one of the deputies. The attorney filed an invoice on Tuesday from acceptance counseling. Oh, thank goodness it wasn't um, like Jody Hildebrand's counseling. Could you imagine? It was connections. Oh my God. Um, Filed an invoice Tuesday from acceptance counseling, showing Richens attended counseling after her husband's death, but before the misdemeanor charge was filed, but not afterwards. Um, that's not going to count, though. Here's the reason that's not going to count. Did we did we catch it all together? She attended counseling after her husband's death, before the charge was filed, but not afterwards. She was supposed to complete this class after, which means if she had already done one, she has to do another one. That's why she didn't get, that's why she didn't get a report because she was doing it to support her own mental health, which I totally support. Grief is real fucking weird. And I think we all need a bit of support in it, but you have to do it after the judge tells you to do it. You can't do it before and be like, I did that. If, if you get a DUI and you get sentenced to like, driving classes. You can't be like, I took driver's ed when I was 16. We're good. No, 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 no. You have to do it after the judge tells you to do it. The court scheduled, scheduled an evidentiary hearing on May 13th. The judge might just, I don't know. The judge may get her, may give her time to do it in custody, but may also just sentence her. Richens was arrested on May 8th, 2023, over a year after her husband's death and charged with aggravated murder and three counts of drug possession with the intent to distribute a second degree felony. I don't love those charges. I don't think she intended to distribute it to anyone other than potentially her husband, but that's just me. A toxicology report showed Eric Richens died with five times the lethal dose of fentanyl in his system, but search warrant affidavit said there was no indication he was a drug user. After her death, she wrote a book helping with grief. Um, if the judge sentences her on the misdemeanor, what happens? She gets six months in custody on the misdemeanor, probably concurrent or time served because she's been in custody since May 2023. So even if they do just sentence her on the misdemeanor, it'd be like she's already served the time and it, it would just go on her record and nothing much more would happen from it. So it just depends on how much she cares about that misdemeanor being on her record while she is facing um, aggravated first degree murder charges though there are reports coming out that the state is proceeding against her as a life case and not a death penalty case. So I guess there are some positives for her in that. I imagine that she's not going to love, and again, I don't know Corey Richens from anyone, but I've read the Walk the Dog letter. I've listened to, not listened to, I've read the phone conversation with her brother, with all of you, she hated the media attention in this case. She and her brother hated the way this case was being discussed. And um, I imagine that they're not going to love all the information in this affidavit for a search warrant coming to light. So um, the tea is scorching. I hope you're ready because uh, we're going to get into this entire search warrant affidavit. And yes, there are parts of it that are redacted which is appropriate. What we don't need on the record are phone numbers and addresses of people that, that are tangentially related. So let's uh let's go to this search warrant, shall we?
affidavit for search warrant. This is from May. Hold on. Let's zoom. Let's zoom to the punchline. This is from uh, right before May. So ninth day of May, 2023. So this would have been contemporaneous to her being arrested for murder is when this affidavit for search warrant would have been submitted. She was arrested May 8th. Emily, you remember those May dates very well. Yes, they are all right around my birthday. So much like Sheena, it is again about me. I'm a content creator. We're just tagging new information with information we won't forget. The undersigned affiant detective Jeff Driscoll, O'Driscoll, Apologies, Jeff. I almost left out the O. Oh. No, don't do it. Don't do it. brain. Stop it. Jeff O'Driscoll of Summit County Sheriff's upon oath and affidavit declares this is going to go through um, his background and training in a minute. They're going to get through what they're looking for. Um, I'm not going to go through a ton of his background training. I don't know if we really need it at this point, but we will get through what he's looking for. One item described as a blue Samsung stylus cell phone with serial number blank belonging to Lisa Darden. Lisa Darden is Corey Richen's mother. In the city of Park City, County of Summit, state of Utah, there is now certain property or evidence described as electronic documents, email, instant messages, text messages. This got misplaced. Personal communications, internet history, personal and business schedules, photographs, images, videos, contact lists, phone numbers, call history, GPS, social media activity and messages, all other digital activities stored on the device. All. We want her phone. All. All. Said property or evidence was unlawfully acquired or is unlawfully possessed. Has been used. That's not true. In this, in this phone. Has been used or is in possession for the purpose of being used to commit or conceal the commission of an offense. That's probably what they're looking for or is evidence of illegal conduct. I don't, one or two of those, one or two of those. Affian believes the property and evidence described above is evidence of the crime or crimes of aggravated murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Again, the mother has not been charged. This is a search warrant affidavit, but this law enforcement officer is laying out the grounds for why they believe that Corey Richens's mother's cell phone is connected to the crimes of aggravated murder and conspiracy to commit murder, which is new information because Corey was not charged with conspiracy to commit murder. And her mother's not been charged. And I don't know if her mother will be charged. But we're going to get all the information of why they thought that they had probable cause for the search warrant. Mike, I'm I'm devastated by this fact, truly. Mike said, since your birthday is in May, Beyonce is not your mom. I know. I learned that last night. I was devastated. Tru truly. More callbacks to the members. Members only live. Robin's Nest said, so the mom is under suspicion. Was. And we're going to find out why. All together. The facts establish grounds for issuance of a search warrant are, and then they go back through Jeff O'Driscoll's experience as a canine handler, a... UAS pilot, a firearms instructor, a SWAT sniper that he's fluent, fluent in Spanish, has assisted in multiple law enforcement agencies with translation, um, is a detective in the CID, and all of his all of his stuff. Like I have done all the things in my past seven years of law enforcement. On March 4th, 2022, at uh 322 hours or 03200 hours, I don't know. 0322 hours. Summit County Dispatch received a 911 call from a female party later identified as Corey Richens. Oh, this was the call the night he passed. This would have been like, I think it was 3.22 a.m. Um, About an unresponsive male. The male was Eric Richens, Corey's husband. Deputies and EMS staff responded to the residents to attempt life-saving measures. Life-saving measures failed, and Eric Richens was declared deceased. Deputies held the scene and requested the ME office as well as detectives from Summit County Sheriff's Office to respond to the scene. While waiting for detectives and the medical examiner, uh, Deputy Wynn conducted an initial interview with Corey Richens. Corey stated she, Eric, and Corey's mother, Lisa Darden, had been celebrating Corey closing on a house for her business the night before until around 2100 hours. This is relatively new information that her mom was there. 
That is not information we saw disclosed in later discussions from Corey, but that they had been celebrating until 2100 hours, um, then, well, prior to midnight. Corey stated they had a drink to celebrate. Corey stated Eric then went to bed. Corey stated she went in to sleep with one of their children due to the fact that the child has night terrors. She stated she woke up around 3 a.m. and came back and to her in Eric's bedroom. She stated at the time she felt Eric and he was cold to the touch. Um, that is when she called 911. After determining that Eric's death was not likely due to natural causes, his body was transported to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. After three weeks toxicology, findings from the autopsy were available. It was determined that Eric died from an overdose of fentanyl. While speaking to the medical examiner's office, the doctor indicated the level of fentanyl in Eric's body was approximately five times the lethal dose. The medical examiner determined the fentanyl was illicit fentanyl and not, not pharmaceutical grade fentanyl. I didn't know they could determine that. Like at all. Didn't know they could determine that. It was also the opinion of the medical examiner doctor that the fentanyl had been ingested orally due to the gastric fluid contents. Very, very interesting. After receiving the information regarding the toxicology, a search warrant was obtained for Eric and Corey's residence. During the service of the search warrant, Corey's phone, as well as several other... Oh, ah, no. What is my computer doing? Computer, stop trying to update things. <sighs> Sorry. Uh, when invest, let's see. It, computer. During the service of the search warrant, they seized Corey's phone and several other computers. Warrants were obtained for all the electronic devices, and the information from those devices was downloaded to be investigated. When investigators went through information from Corey's phone, it appeared several text messages from the time frame of March 1st through March 15th had been deleted, the time surrounding Eric's death. Several communications between Tori, Corey and Redacted were located. Through the course of the investigation, detectives began to investigate individuals close to Corey and Eric. During the time, Redacted was identified as being a housekeeper, often used by Corey for her residential real estate business. So I think helping with the homes that were being shown, sold, whatever. A police records check of Redacted revealed multiple counts of possession of controlled substances with intent to distribute possession of controlled substances and possession of drug paraphernalia. Redacted also had charges of theft, DUI, burglary, and aggravated assault. Due to the fact that fentanyl was discovered in Eric Richens and that it was illicit fentanyl, it was plausible that Redacted was the source of the fentanyl. Redacted has already come into this case quite a bit because they have cooperated with police and, and told police literally everything. So um, for those of you saying this, this name has been released, this name was released um, Anna, in connection with the detention hearing, I'm, I'm, they're cooperating with police. It's redacted out of here. I don't think any more needs to be really said about that, but that individual's name has become known through the detention hearing and through their cooperation with law enforcement. Um, it's going to come up when this goes to trial and preliminary hearing anyway, because they said, yeah, I went and got fentanyl for Corey Richens and gave it to her. And then she came back later and asked for stronger fentanyl and I got her stronger fentanyl and then gave it to her. So this person has made clear that um, they provided fentanyl to Corey Richens shortly in time before the husband's death from fentanyl overdose, which uh, is going to be hard evidence for the defense to work around. While conducting an investigation into um, redacted, other redacted was also was identified as an associate of redacted a redacted b has a chemistry degree then is oh my god let him cook why are we back to heisenberg in this search warrant sorry redacted b has a chemistry degree and had previously uh charged in is it heber city uh with clandestine lab charges for operating a meth lab how did we get to a meth lab with a chemistry degree this is why I don't read these things in advance. I don't read them in advance. I read them with you because we all just need to figure it out. <laughs> Yo, science, Mr. Witt. Oh my goodness. Uncover, unrecovered search, Google search results, luxury therapy for the rich, right? Um, 
Ems said, oh, wait, I was late. Is this the one who was writing a book? Wrote a children's book and is now writing another book. Abs absolutely. So we, we've gotten back to Breaking Bad. I didn't realize that most of the cases that I'm covering are like one degree of separation from Breaking Bad. I, I didn't realize that. I, I didn't know it when it happened during the Hannah Gutierrez trial, and I didn't know that we were here. Um, I will say, just Jay in the, the chat said clandestine chemistry. I will say that while um, thinking errors is a unique name for things, I am fucking in love with the fact that the charge for manufacturing methamphetamine is clandestine lab charges. Like Utah, th this slaps. I'm absolutely here. I'm absolutely here for it. Clandestine lab charges is so good. It's so good. It's just such a good name. Um, so for all the the charging um, document quirks in Utah, this this one absolutely delights me. Wait, somebody said clandestine chemistry is a great band name. Oh, Cammy, I think clandestine chemistry is a great band name. I I playing the side stage at Coachella with Queen Herbie. Um, maybe she wrote Breaking Bad too. Um, maybe she maybe she did, or maybe she'll say that she did. Oh my God. Utah, this is delightful. Absol absolutely delightful. Clandestine lab charges for operating a meth lab. It was learned that, I'm assuming this is redacted A. It might be redacted B. I don't know which person we're talking about now. It was learned that one of the redacted parties has a boyfriend named Redacted, who's probably Redacted C at this point, who is currently incarcerated at Redacted Prison Facility. After learning, so we've got three people, it seems. After learning this information, detectives spoke to staff. The way I'm going to text my kid about clandestine lab charges, he's going to be like, chemistry. Um, after learning this information, detectives spoke to staff at, I'm imagining that's redacted um, prison facility, and requested phone calls made from March 1st through March 15th. During one phone call between redacted parties on March 2nd, 2022, redacted answers the phone and states he is on a break from drug court. It was verified through court records that the individuals were in drug court together at that time. This is, this is, it, it's just a throwback. It's interesting. There's times in cases where you can track information from people being in court together through the phone calls because they will distribute information from like being transported to court together and having conversations and then those will go out on the recorded phone calls but all the phone calls are recorded it's just a matter of finding the phone call from the day um to tie it all back together it was verified through court records that the parties were in drug court together at the time at 232 in the call redacted says tell redacted i say hi a female can then be heard in the background saying hi honey um redacted then responds by saying hi on March 3rd, 2022, they called a phone number blank. That is one of the phone numbers investigators identified as belonging to. This is so difficult with everything being redacted. Not redacted starts the call by saying, good morning. The remainder of the call is discussing a possible mutual acquaintance um, that somebody knows in prison. On March 4th, individual makes a phone call to other individual during the phone call the individuals are discussing purchasing an xbox controller while he is maybe in custody makes the comment he would pay for the controller then responds by saying you or blank one of the two then responds by saying i tried to give that bitch a hundred dollars yesterday and say hey let me pay you back i'm paying you back she was all what the fuck? No, you keep it. I just made a thousand dollars selling fucking fentanyl or some shit like that. That call between those two occurred the same day Eric Richens died. So they're using the jail calls to tie together the seller. No, they're using the jail calls, it seems, to bolster the evidence that the seller of the methamphetamine actually sold the methamphetamine. Um, Lisa Thornton in the chat said clandestine chemistry could tour with acoustic alchemy. I think we've built an entire lineup and I absolutely love it. Here's the thing when you are working with, I'm just going to take a sidebar real quick. Sidebar. I didn't need a different sidebar noise because that's my speculation noise, but we need a different sidebar noise. Sidebar. When you're working with someone who is 
in custody, facing custody time, and they are essentially working um, and cooperating with law enforcement. It is always very helpful that there is evidence to bolster what they're saying because a jury will sit there after cross-examination and be like, but why wouldn't they lie though? Like you're telling me they're gonna get no sentence if they just say whatever about the person on trial? Like, but wouldn't you lie though? So when there is external or other evidence to bolster or prove what they're saying, it goes a lot better in court when you have the person who's taking a deal with law enforcement to testify and then other evidence like a phone call saying, I just made $1,000 selling fucking fentanyl. Um, those things start to bolster each other so it becomes easier to prove that the person is being truthful and not just saying whatever to take a deal. It is something, especially when you are dealing with deals with with people who have, um, with people who are either already in custody working as informants or people who are facing substantial time, something that really helps the jury understand that they're not just lying because they're trying to get out of something, that they're cooperating with police because they're trying to get out of something. And they're like, look, I'll trade on information. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit about that person. I will tell you what you want to know to do less time in custody. But you have to make sure that that information is truthful. On March 27th, individual was arrested on misdemeanor traffic offenses and booked into custody on May 2nd, myself and other detectives interviewed individual while in custody. Post Miranda warning, that person admitted to supplying Corey Richens with 15 to 30 fentanyl pills on two separate occasions, approximately one month before Eric's death. She stated Corey paid her approximately $900 each time she supplied the pills. I don't know the street value of fentanyl, y'all. That seems uh, like a lot to me. Maybe it's not. I nine hundred. Okay. She provided details of the solicitation of the drugs, the pickup and drop off locations and other pertinent details that has been corroborated with digital forensic evidence. Huge information there as well. So if the phones also corroborate these two individuals were in that area at that time where the hand to hands were happening, it really, really helps corroborate. In investigating Corey Richens' associates, it was discovered that in 2006, Richens' mother, Lisa Darden, was living with an adult female with whom she was having a romantic relationship. In April of that year, her romantic partner died unexpectedly. And this is where shit starts to get weird, right? The died unexpectedly is, uh, is something that's going to raise an eyebrow in hindsight. It might not have raised an eyebrow in 2006, but when you look back, it raised an eyebrow for police. Um, the died unexpectedly. An autopsy report of the female partner showed that her immediate cause of death was drug poisoning from an overdose of oxycodone. So that's weird. Further investigation showed that Lisa Darden has been named as the beneficiary of her partner's estate a short time before her death. What now? What now? What now? She was named the beneficiary of her partner's estate a short time before her partner's unexpected death due to poisoning. Really? That seems strange. Insert that suspicious meme. That's odd. And this is why law enforcement is bringing it up. Lisa Darden was named the beneficiary of her partner's estate a short time before her death. Um, the partner did not have any current, wait, the partner did have current prescriptions for oxycodone and reportedly struggled with abusing her meds which is probably why nothing was made of this because you never know. Can people accidentally OD? They can. She, however, was not in a state of recovery from addiction at the time of her death. Okay. Based on my training and experience, this would rule out the possibility of accidental overdose. I think what law enforcement is trying to say here is that she was... And a lot of times where you see accidental overdoses, 
not just an oxycodone, but in other drugs, um, this happens a lot with heroin, is when somebody has been in recovery and um, falls out of recovery. I don't know how to say that any differently, but uh, relapses, that's the word that the brain was looking for. They will often relapse back to a dosage that they had been using before they were um, recovering. So they lose a bit of their tolerance and can accidentally overdose after a period of recovery when they relapse. So they are indicating that there was not a change in tolerance for the medication, making it more unlikely that she would have accidentally overdosed on oxycodone that she was act actively using. It's that, it's that recovery relapse period that can be so absolutely incredibly dangerous. Um, so with this, and I see a lot of you talking about some of the, the more famous um, cases of that and, and folks who have died in that manner. So law enforcement is trying to narrow down that the partner was unlikely to accidentally OD because she was just actively using um, oxycodone and was not relapsing into using oxycodone. In reviewing forensic downloads of Corey Richens' phone, it is clear she is very close with her mother. We saw that in the other phone calls. And communication communicates with her almost daily, both for personal matters and in her business dealings. Conversations have been found on Corey's phone to show disdain for Eric on Lisa's part. Oh, weird. Her mom hates her partner? That's so strange, Donna Adelson. That's so unusual. We've we've never seen that before. Look, here's the thing. I your your child's partner, I imagine it would be very I don't know. I don't have to deal with this. My kids are young. Um, I imagine it would be very difficult to not get along with your child's chosen partner. But murder is not the option. Why do people think murder is the option? Uh, Donna has not been convicted of murder. Those are allegations pending trial. So conversations have been found on Corey's phone showing disdain for Eric from her mother. Based on Lisa Darden's proximity to her partner's suspicious overdose death, overdose death, her relationship to Corey, it is possible she was involved in planning and orchestrating Eric's death. Oh. Oh. On May 8th, the detective served a search warrant on Lisa Darden's house. A blue Samsung phone was recovered and identified as Lisa's current cell phone. I'm applying for a warrant to search the digital contacts of the phone. Um, and this is the rest of the, your affiant request pursuant to the rules that the phone be searched in the manner above. Due to the sensitive and ongoing nature of the associated homicide case, your affiant requests that the warrant be sealed while the investigation is ongoing. I wonder if this means that the investigation is closed and they are not going to charge the mother. This would make it very hard for the mother to testify. The mother was there that night. Um, let's see. Search one blue stylus phone for all the things listed above, internet history, documents, communications, all of the yada yada, and it is applied to be sealed. It was sealed on May 9th. It was just unsealed this week. So law enforcement was very much looking at mom as well and searched mom's phone. It's going to be very interesting to see what comes up about mom's phone in the preliminary hearing that is set for May 15th. Y'all, we have a date for preliminary hearing. I am very selfishly hoping that this is a multi-day preliminary hearing. It will be streamed, um, which is my understanding. Everything in this case that has been open to the public has been streamed. I will be very interested to see how this preliminary hearing goes. Very interested to see what comes up and very interested to see all of this. And it's before CrimeCon is here in Nashville, so we're all around on May 15th. We got things to do. Hopefully, the Karen Reed case will be done by May 15th so we can cover this. Law enforcement was looking at the mom 
who showed disdain for the husband had a close proximity to a suspicious death of her partner shortly after she was made the beneficiary. And then we have Corey Richens, who, with the true crime rights itself, Corey Richens, who thought she was going to be the beneficiary of Eric's estate until he, unbeknownst to her, changed his will and made his sisters the beneficiaries. And the day that she found out that the sisters were the beneficiary, she punches the sister and four people have to pull her off of her. What are the chances, speculation, what are the chances that Corey believed that she was going to get all of the money from Eric's business and his estate? I would say high. I would say it's a high probability that she was motivated in part by money. So isn't that weird? Let's do a quick summary of that before we get to the hearing from, um, what is my, what is Dr. B texting me? Dr. B, watch out. <laughs> I'm kidding. My mother no longer has disdain for Dr. B. We've been married for too long. <laughs> there were moments at the beginning where it was a little bit rough. I didn't get a code. Um, a code and I'm dreaming. <laughs> The man, the man knows I stream on Tuesday and Thursday and is still like, can we just do this now? No. Let's do a quick summary of what's going on with this, and then we will get into that hearing in Idaho, shall we? I want to zoom, zoom, because if we have time to get to other stuff, we will. Um, I don't know. I think those in-law relationships can be great. They can be not great, and they can just be meh. Um, I also think relationships change over time, and that's uh that's a good thing but my dad always adored my husband my mom came around it took her a minute but she came around <laughs> she came around um i don't think disdain was the right word i think um protectiveness is maybe the right word corey richens's mother was at least being looked at by law enforcement in connection with the potential murder charges, and conspiracy to commit murder charges. In the affidavit to search Corey Richens' mother's phone, her mother's name is Karen Darden, to search the mother's phone, law enforcement laid out that Karen Darden had, sorry, Lisa Darden. I'm going to do that again, Miguelina, because I, I said her name wrong the entire part. Law nerds, I'm sorry, we're live streaming. Um, and I just called her the wrong name like the entire time. Apologies. What we learned from the search warrant in the Corey Richens case is that her mother, Lisa Darden, was also being looked at by law enforcement in a search warrant affidavit um, as an application to search the phone for all contacts of Corey Richens' mother, Lisa. Law enforcement laid out that Lisa had a romantic partner die unexpectedly shortly after the partner named Lisa Darden as the beneficiary of her estate. That partner died from an overdose of oxycodone. However, it was something that she was prescribed and something that she had been struggling with, but it was not a circumstance where she had stopped using oxycodone and then relapsed into using it. So law enforcement made the connection that the mother's um, close proximity to the unexpected um, death of her partner shortly after being made the beneficiary of the estate. The fact that Lisa Darden was there um, at least earlier in the evening, the night that Eric Richens died. Law enforcement were not, um, were, how do I say this better? Law enforcement were investigating the possibility that she aided or assisted Corey Richens in the, let's just go to the warrant and read it. Law enforcement said, quote, it is possible that she was involved in the planning and orchestrating of Eric's death. They also said that there were quite a lot of communications between Corey and her mother, indicating not only the closeness of their relationship, but the fact that Corey's mother had, quote, disdain for Eric Richens, the victim in this case. Has she been charged? No. Will she be charged? Maybe not. That suspicious death was in 2006. 
But you know what we've all learned from the cases I cover here on the channel? There is no statute of limitation on homicide cases. So if new information comes up in those search warrants related to that unexpected death in 2006, it is possible. Could we see her charged in connection with Corey Richens' case? That has not happened yet, but I'm sure law enforcement is keeping a very close eye on jail communications between Corey and her mother. And I wonder if that's why Corey was communicating through her brother and through the walk the dog letter to instruct her mom about certain things. It certainly is an unusual twist in what has been a very unusual case. I didn't expect this at all, but um, it's weird, isn't it? We'll see what happens with this. Corey Richens will be back in court May 15th for a preliminary hearing. I will be covering that live because I am fascinated to see what else comes out in this case. All right, I tried to do that better so it can go on quick bits. Look at me, like a YouTuber, like an actual content creator, so that those of you that don't catch the whole stream can catch just the quick bits and it's clear. But um, look, and uh, Aggie Marie in the chat said, as you said, Emily, true crime writes itself. I regularly quote, bad religion, that sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. What I have learned in 17 years as a lawyer and what I have learned working particularly in the criminal justice system is you cannot make this shit up. There is no wilder human drama than the things that play out in court. It is unexpected. It is unscripted. It is emotional. People are in heightened states. All the things that happen in a reality show I mean, generally minus the drinking in court, one would hope. All the things that happen in a reality show that are false, uh, shows like The Amazing Race and Survivor try to put you under st false stress and duress or introduced stress and duress to trigger the kind of difficult decision-making that happens under that kind of stress and duress. We see that naturally play out in court. When you are in court, as a party, when you are in court as a lawyer, you are under a level of stress and duress, and things just go unexpected sometimes. And uh, we've seen that case after case. Every single case I have covered trial or hearings on, every single one has had moments where we're all just like, that did not just happen. Every single one. And it doesn't have to be a high profile case. This will happen in cases all the time. Um, but it's why court is so fascinating to me it's why looking at these cases is so interesting and why i do try to balance it's been very murdery here lately but why i try to balance the um high profile criminal cases with the civil cases that are also wild because the things people do to each other that they end up getting sued for are wild the allegations are wild and then balance that all out with food court so that we all have uh, uh some balance in the things. Let's go to um let's go to Idaho, shall we? We need to y'all, we're just going from Utah to Idaho. Oh, yes, Miguelina, go ahead and end the poll. 58% of you have been covering the Corey Richens case. 42% of you had not. I bet 100% of you are like, "Girl, tell me more. When are we riding into court for this case? When this goes to trial, are we going to cover all of it?" Yes. Yes. Yes, we are. Um Heather Lamb says, it's just all the skeletons that are coming out of the closet. I know it's like a reality show. It's absolutely like a reality show. Um, because if you go on reality TV, all the skeletons are going to come out of the closet. Let's take the quick hop from Utah to Idaho. I think most of you would probably do this by car, but we're doing it by EDB Air. <laughs> Also, before we get into Idaho, I have to make a huge thank you and shout out to my amazing live stream producer and editor, Miguelina, who you will see in the chat as Tech Valor. Um, while we were covering everything going on in State versus Hannah Gutierrez, she made sure to uh, stream and grab this hearing from Idaho for us so that we would have it in the midst of all of the other live streaming that was going on because the court in Idaho has started live streaming their own um, hearings. The court said, uh, media, cameras, get out of my courtroom. Like, we don't know you, you don't go here, yeet. We're just gonna stream it to our own YouTube channel. 
but the court doesn't put them up in advance. They like literally pop up onto the YouTube channel moments before they go live. And then the second the live is done, they go down. We learned that in the middle of the hearing last time, like in the middle of the hearing, the feed went private. I was like, the fuck just happened? Because the second the hearing is done, the court takes it down off their YouTube channel. So there are no um, video log of them. So Migalina made sure that we had it and that the, the law nerds would be able to cover this hearing when we were done with trial. And today is the day that we are going to do that. So let's give a quick road so far in Idaho before, um, before we get into this hearing. Much has happened with the prosecution of Brian Koberger for the death of four University of Idaho students in Moscow, Idaho. The court has not yet set a trial date, but in this hearing that we're going to be covering today, we will hear the attorneys arguing over setting that trial date. They are now arguing about dates in the summer of 2025. There has also been ongoing discovery arguments about DNA, about what the prosecution needs to turn over. The defense has made numerous motions, some which will be addressed in the hearing we're seeing, some that will get set over for another date, including a motion to change venue, saying that the trial cannot be held in Moscow, Idaho, because they cannot find an impartial jury pool. That hearing has been set out for another date. We will see all those dates in this hearing today. So this court hearing they are going to cover, and I have not watched the entire hearing yet, we're gonna watch it together, but they are going to cover more about discovery, they are going to cover more about dates, they are going to talk about Brian Koberger's appeal of the last hearing that we watched, where the court denied the um, motion to reconsider overturning the indictment in the Koberger case. The Supreme Court has since denied that motion to overturn the indictment. Remember, Koberger was arguing that the indictment needed to be overturned because the grand jury was instructed wrong. Where have we seen that? Baldwin, arguing that the grand jury was instructed wrong because they were told the standard for the um, grand jury was probable cause not beyond a reasonable doubt. The standard in every jurisdiction across the United States is probable cause. The argument is that Utah law back at the time of the Magna Carta codified jury and not a different between grand and petite jury. And so a trial jury is beyond a reasonable doubt. Ergo, a grand jury is beyond a reasonable doubt. That's oversimplifying their argument. But this is an argument that's been cropping up in Idaho. I imagine what we will see as the legislature just codifying this into the code so that it's no longer coming up or the courts will eventually take one of these cases and say, no, just no. And the Supreme Court has said that mul multiple times, but it still is coming up. So we're going to see all of those arguments um, and see what the court rules on today in Idaho. There has been a ton of activity on the docket. All of it is sealed. All of it is sealed. Motions arguing over discovery, motions arguing over what's getting turned over, and a date being set for a new alibi to be turned over. And we're going to learn more about that hopefully in this hearing. I'm optimistic, y'all. I'm optimistic that we're going to find out about that in this hearing. So let me go ahead and pull this up. Um, thank okay. you. Uh, ah, Judge Judge, don't start yet. Don't stop me now, Judge Judge. Um, let me in big in the court and in small in me real quick so that we can go through this together. This is going to be about an hour of court. So let me put, let me put me down there. There we go. I'm too small. Hate it. Nope. Now I'm covering the prosecutor. <laughs> Emily D Baker for the state, your honor. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Let me move. Let me move me. Emily, your head out of the way. That's better. <laughs> StreamYard makes it so easy for me to change the layouts that I can't help myself. Are we still on potato audio? Probably, which is a really good point. Let me bump the audio on this just knowing that we need to and this is this is from our our law nerd tv channel where we are holding these videos so that we can share them with you so again thank you Migalina. this is the best can i put me in the upper corner no that's where i'm going to put the closed captioning so that the closed captioning is going to go up at the top and then if you're watching on tv 
I know that the chat will cover Judge Judge's face a little bit, and I don't want to. Um, I don't want to do that either. So let us get rolling. Hopefully, this sounds good. I should swoop. We're starting the year. We're starting the year. All right, Judge Judge, let's go. All right. Sorry for the delay. Thanks, sir. Uh, we are now on the record. This is State versus Brian Koberger, CR 29222805. Mr. Koberger is here in the courtroom. He is represented by uh, Ms. Taylor and Ms. Nassif. Uh, Mr. Judge. It's an interesting view on the council table. So you'll see Koberger in his suit next to his attorneys. And then the prosecution starts with the lead prosecutor with the very big Santa beard. And then we'll go from there. Let's, I'm going to bump this audio a little bit more. Um, and that's about all we can do because potato. Logston uh, is participating via Zoom. Zoom. Uh, the state is right. Logston is the sassy one. I enjoy him. He's the one that did the dissertation on the Magna Carta and no shade to him. It was, a, it was, a bit much for criminal court, but he's preserving the record in a capital case. And he's been very sassy. I enjoy, um, I enjoy Logston arguing. I don't always agree with where he's going, but I enjoy the vigor with which he does it. Represented by Bill Thompson, Ashley Jennings, Jeff Nye, and Ingrid Beatty. Um, the proceedings, I hope, I think they are, are live streaming <laughs> through the court's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, the court... Judge Judge is just becoming a content creator. Hey guys, can you see me? Are we live yet? Oh, Judge Judge, bless it. We can see you. So please do not attempt to record, film, or transmit uh, during the proceedings. Thank you for that. The only All filming, right, so recording, have, and transmitting uh, is through the court's own website. Uh, to address today. Uh, and I thought we should first go with the defendant's motion to allow experts and investigators access to view IgG information. So just to be clear, the court was instructing those on the Zoom that they could not record the Zoom because it is streaming to YouTube, not that the stream to YouTube could not be captured and preserved, just so we're clear. If, if that makes uh, sense, I think. Also, the motion to clarify Judge Judge loved it for disclosure of IPG and Spicy Vet MD uh, Spicy Vet Med Geek said Judge Judge seemed to enjoy the law presented all the way back to the 1800s. He had such a full law nerd moment. You could see like he reminds me of somebody who would be a great law school professor or adjunct professor because he loved the intellectual conversation. I think he knew he was going to deny it, but he loved the intellectual back and forth about the law, exploring the law. You could see how excited he was to have that conversation. And then at the end of the day, he was like, yeah, but no. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but no. But he genuinely seems to be excited to have those conversations. And um I think if Judge Judge is ever not on the bench, we will probably find him teaching law school. Or, hey, Judge Judge, there's plenty of room on the interwebs to explain the law to people. You're a delight. We would we would be happy to have you here on the YouTubes, sir. We're just into that. So go ahead, Ms. Taylor. Thank not you. me speaking for all of YouTube. If you are I reading don't. the state's response, I think the state has no objection to the three named experts having access to the sealed IgG materials or the material subject to protective order. IgG so are really the DNA materials that were ordered, turned over last time. The defense is saying, hey, we need our experts to have access to it. It's sealed. The state's not objecting um, to the experts getting the sealed information, they just don't want the public to get it. But the experts who need to look at it can't get it. Talking about is our investigative team for Brian's case to have access to the IgG materials. And the state has objected to that. They've objected in part because they are not named in our motion. So I want to address that first. Your Honor, they are not named, and I can name them, that's not a problem, but the reason I didn't is based on consistency. These same investigators have had access to the grand jury materials to assist us in the case. I lost they my have hand access hand. to other things subject to protective order, yeah. and they're not named in those. They have access, those three, there's three items subject to other protective order, and that's medical information from hospitals, 
that's University of Idaho records, and most recently, police procedures. They haven't been required to be named in orders in any of those. And so for consistency, I did the same thing. Um, but we can name them if that is a sticking point. I would note that the members of the FBI that did the analysis are not named in the materials either. Your Honor, the reason why our investigators are important to have access to the IGG, IGG materials. I honestly don't even think they should have to argue over this. Their investigators need access to the material to investigate the case. It's it it feels like the argument is so obvious it doesn't even need to be made. Um, Jer in the chat, and I don't know why my StreamYard is not bumping my face up when I do this. Wait, is the court's last name actually judge? Yes. This is Judge John C. Judge. So he is, in fact, Judge Judge, which I adore. It's because of the kind of case this is and the kind of investigation that we're required to launch in the case. We have to have investigators on a death penalty case, and we have them. Yes. These materials or these items in the IgG binder, those are things that we may end up filing motions in court in order to prepare for those, we rely on our investigators to help us with side tasks, with big tasks, with all of the tasks. We would need to utilize our experts. If our investigators can't have access to the materials, they'll have to be shut out of those meetings with those experts, and they'll have to be shut out of court proceedings that we might launch related to those materials. Your Honor, to meet our constitutional duties, in Brian's case, his rights to have effective assistance of counsel, to have a full investigation, to have a fair trial, we have to have investigators. Those investigators are on board and have been on board, and they help us understand things that are given to us by the state. They help us find witnesses. They help she us find experts. She shouldn't have to explain these things. And they're necessary things. to be part of the conversation. I think this is all of what for the, the record. IGG materials are and what they mean. This Shock, here's here's the shocker. Lawyers aren't scientists. The thing with lawyers is they generally have to become experts in their case and their own experts and investigators help inform them, which is why you see lawyers start to specialize. So lawyers who do catastrophic injury cases start to learn quite a lot about medicine, anatomy, the body. Um, they're going to be able to tell you the different levels, if this is even a thing of like subdural hematomas, because they deal with it so much. Lawyers are really trained to continue to learn. Um, I think life is a lifelong learning process, but lawyers are really trained to continue to learn. And so you need to know as much about your case as the, you know, scientist who do the DNA. And when you are on the side of the prosecution, you use the state's experts for that, the folks at the crime lab, law enforcement officers, detectives, they help you become the expert in the thing you need to be the expert in. When you are on the side of the defense, you need to bring in your investigators to help teach you all the things you need to know. And I imagine um, that Ann Taylor already has a really good basis in, in DNA and background. Lots of lawyers do when they work with it, but they need those experts to help them distill all the information, process all the information. This case has, what, 50 plus terabytes of information. They need people to help distill that for them. Um, and it's it's why you see lawyers start to branch off in cases or covering the types of cases they're really interested in. I love technology. I did a lot of more white collar cases. Why? I got to dig through phones and emails and Facebook accounts and bank records, and I loved doing that. And I could explain cell phone data and, you know, ping data and all of that well, because I loved it. I didn't necessarily want to go through just like dude A shot dude B because beef. So you start to learn the things you want to know about all of this. What is IgG? It is a part of the familial DNA. So when they're talking about all of this, they're getting to how, and they're still arguing over how law enforcement used Koberger's family DNA, I believe it was his dad's that was recovered from a trash can in Pennsylvania, to identify Koberger and match it back to things they had at the scene. Matters in figuring out how Mr. Koberger ends up 
Um, OBG Foster asked a great question in the chat, and this is what I love about doing things a little behind real time as we can have these conversations while I'm covering something. Ann Taylor has done a fantastic job. She doesn't just refer to her client as Brian to humanize him to the court. She looks at him, she includes him in conversations. If you are ever in this situation from everything we've seen, I would say you would absolutely want Ann Taylor on your side. She is thorough, she is prepared. She, um, the court listens to her. There are some defense attorneys when they start talking, you can see the court just like shut down because of the way they approach the court. She is a very good advocate without uh, without being overly adversarial. I find her to be very effective. I'm really excited to see her in trial. She's been a very good attorney. Um, and I've really liked watching her in court. So if you're ever in this situation, you absolutely want um, someone like Ann Taylor in your corner. And so when we were talking in State versus Gutierrez, we were talking about the fact that Hannah Gutierrez had a private attorney. And at the beginning of the case, I was like, Mr. Bowles, I like your style of cross-examination. And then I realized his style of cross-examination was, I don't know what I'm asking, so that's why I'm asking open-ended questions. Would you rather have Mr. Bowles or would you rather have Ann Taylor if you are sitting in that defendant chair? And I would love to know what you guys would think just from what we've watched in court. Um, so when people disparage public defenders, and this doesn't happen in this chat because you're law nerds and you don't disparage anybody, but it does happen frequently. Remember that Ann Taylor is a public defender. She is a public servant that is excellent at her job as many, many are. Um, so that is my plug for, for all of this. Let's Police continue radar on. and subject to these proceedings here. I know we've talked about this before and I still don't have all of those answers. I believe today with our experts getting access, we're gonna make some headway with that, but we also need our investigators to be part of those discussions as well. Again, Your Honor, if their names appearing in a court order is an issue, that we'll do that. We'll do that. That's inconsistent with the other protective orders, but we'll do that. And they'll be subject to the protective order just like we are, and they'll abide by it just like they've done for the other protected materials they've had access to. And while we're on that line, if the court wants me to talk about the clarification, I can do that. Let's let's, uh, let's hear for, from the state first. I, I mean, I understand the uh, having investigators. I think what we're talking about, though, is just with the IgG, that we have to be especially careful about you know, who's going to have the access, uh, what they're going to do with it. Uh, I think uh, I agree. Um, it's so the court wants to know why all the investigators need this data that is being turned over under protective order. Why do all the investigators need it? Who, I think he's trying to narrow down, who is the scientist that is reviewing the way that this DNA data was worked with? Because that's the person that needs it. The whole team doesn't need it. He's trying to limit how many people have it. He's been very in control of who sees what, who says what, who talks to who since the beginning of the case. Clear that the state has no objection to the uh, three experts that you named. Uh, so I don't think that's a problem. But let me go to what, Ms. Ms. Jennings? Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, that's yeah. correct, Your Honor. And Your Honor is familiar and aware of the materials that we're discussing. And you're also aware uh, of the sensitive nature of those materials. The state is really just following the court's lead in your protective order where you named specifically who on the defense team would be allowed to have access. It follows that if we're gonna expand that access- Sorry, the woodpecker's being a dick again outside my window to some of the other birds. And it's really gonna be the only way the court can have control woodpeckers. of any unauthorized dissemination is to know exactly who was given was privy what was enclosed so at a bare minimum we need to know who it's going to be just who it's going to be i think that's to. fair tell us who's who's got um it. your december 29th sealed order also said that um any further dissemination of the materials or the information contained within the materials including to any investigator or experts must be approved by the court after a showing by the defense as to why such individual needs the information 
Um, in the defense's motion, their stated reasoning is, quote, to investigate how and when Mr. Koberger was identified as a suspect, end quote. State maintains they don't need access to all of that highly sensitive information. Um, to satisfy that purpose that is laid out in the November 28, 2023 letter from the FBI to the state. So we'd be, we would ask that one, they be named, if they are granted access, that it be to that letter, um, and that the balance of the materials be protected. And we would ask that you follow the proposed language in the state's response from February 9th um, to ensure further protections of the materials. So the reason, and I, I see the comment from um, Sunsuki, I hope I pronounced that right. I probably didn't, but I'm trying. The prosecutor directly addressing the court as you or yours throwing me for a loop. It's generally you would see it saying you, your honors ruling or your honors this, um, but they're talking about the court's previous ruling and the state's like, we just want to know who has access to this. Again, in a case where everyone seems very worried about information getting publicly leaked and when you're dealing with DNA information and the connection between other extended members of Brian Koberger's family, like his aunt or uncle or cousins or whatever, shouldn't be put on blast in the media if, if any of their if any of their information is included in any of this. Um, they want to make sure they know exactly who is getting the information. I think it's fair for it to be disclosed to them exactly who's getting it. I don't think that's a far cry. <clears throat> Well, Your Honor, I, I know what letter Ms. Jennings refers to, and I think our experts should have access to the actual materials. That letter is a summary. It's a police summary. Our duty is to investigate police work. We do that in every case, and with our heightened duties in a death penalty case, our investigators should have access to the entire record. Our investigators understand what a protective order is and they'll abide by that protective order. Again, if you want them named in any order allowing them access, that's fine. That's just fine with me. It's most important that they have access to all of the materials. The summary contained in the FBI's letter isn't the totality of the materials. It doesn't show some of the particulars about things that were happening on certain dates, and that's what's important to put into a timeline so that we can try to understand how the state did its work in this case. Well, one of the issues with this IGP is relevance at all. Uh, and so the way I'm viewing it is they did needs to uh, go on steps, maybe where it's justified uh, with Judge, the you relevance or the your Honor, you told the state to turn it over to them. You don't get to then decide how how their experts look at it. What Judge Judge is saying is, hey, we don't know if the IgG is relevant. If this goes to trial, this isn't going to come in. Like none of this is for trial. All of this arguing over evidence is for potential suppression motions down the road. If the state did something potentially, um, objectionable at the beginning of the case and i want to be careful with my words because this is setting up future arguments this isn't happening um but if the state did something wrong then the defense or objectionable then the defense can make suppression motions then the defense can try to keep it out what do i think the defense is trying to keep out uh the dna on the knife sheath found by the victims that's where i think we're going with this so the defense wants to back all the way up to the beginning of the chain so that they can attack it there to try to suppress evidence down the road that is absolutely their job and so the judge is like look this isn't even relevant for trial so we need to go step by step of who needs it why it's relevant and how you need to use it relevance for some of that information because from the very beginning uh, the state's position has been it has no bearing on the case it will not have any bearing on trial I think she wants to use it for but suppression motions. That's I my guess. The access to uh, what I thought was potentially relevant uh, and to allow your experts, now allowing your experts to view that information. So let me just kind of 
move into the other um, clarification because I also understand particularly uh, relevance of mitigation. Okay, what the what your um, investigators need to cover, they likely have to uh, have contact with Mr. Kogler's family, and that we're not we're not I don't think we're talking about that kind of. Uh, no, that's not what they're talking and about at all. That is your responsibility. It's all also, if the defense wants to talk to Koberger's family, they're just going to ask Koberger and go talk to his family. Also, your responsibility to dig in wherever you, wherever you have, have to zealous have advocacy. To, yes, you your honor. Think you're required to do that. So, your honor, can you tell me where I left my, my hand? Um, really balancing. I'm distracted. Responsibility is ah. to keep it in control to some degree. So I guess I, I what I'm asking is that I have some justification uh, for. I can't help it. He just said, tell me why. Yes, I'm gonna start singing Backstreet Boys in the middle of court. Tell me why, that's what he's saying. Tell me why you want it. Here's my issue with that, is that he already told them they could have it. Stop trying to make them justify it 17 times. Either give it to them or don't give it to them. Give it to a handful of the investigators that are evaluating it under protective order and move on. But he very much, and I like Judge Judge, what would be frustrating practicing in front of Judge Judge is he very much wants control over every single aspect of the proceedings, of the turnover. He is very very engaged in what's happening in this case. I wonder if he's like that in all cases or if he is particularly attuned to it because this is um this is such a high profile matter. They can contact with thank you chat for singing with me that may have no bearing whatsoever on the case unless it's in mitigation or something like that. Now the DNA issues especially i mean maybe especially in the igg it has to have some relevance if there's some um context okay that connects to the case itself chad i hear you after we get past the igg stuff that's a little bit uh that takes a little bit for me to follow i will go to 1.25 as we get to other stuff i will but for this i need it at normal speed for me to follow. That's how that I'm looking at it. I might be wrong, but so you can respond. Okay. All right. Especially We're with the potatoes. A of different things here. Uh, let's see if I can, let's see if we can just go all the way up to 600 and if it makes it better. The potatoes get worse the faster we go is the problem. With our request for clarification, I was talking specifically about people that are already known to our team that we may be in contact with, friends, direct family, parents, sisters, aunts and uncles. Did you, did you catch how careful she was? I really like Ann Taylor. That we may be in contact with, not giving any indication of whether they are or if they aren't. It's just so good to watch. It, it's just so good to watch. Really, really good. Interrupt you just for one sure. second. That, that has no re relevance to the IGG information that you were you were given. There's no. Those are people we already knew before. Okay. okay. Um, so I want clarification that I can continue to talk to the Coburger family. Yes. I, I want to make sure I'm not running a foul of court order. Like, and and I, I want to be. This is this is why I did not speed it up because they're starting to talk over each other a little bit, which this court does. He's he's interrupting her, and I would be that way as a judge. I'm that way all the time, neurodivergent. But because there is a very strict non dissemination order in place at this point, she has moved to start to clarify that she can talk to Koberger's family, especially as it re maybe relates to whether that is how they used the familial DNA to get to Koberger without running afoul of the court's non-dissemination order. We have switched topics in the fucking middle of this conversation. 
about the non-dissemination order. I want to be really clear who I'm asking for to have access to the IGGs. It's not our mitigation investigator. That our mitigation investigator, I think the court heard me talk about going three gen generations back to do her work. That's required under, under the ABN. I'm not the mitigation the mitig i love being able to stop this and explain midway through we're doing like law school by video today the mitigation x the mitigation investigation goes to a potential death penalty phase of this case because if he is convicted and again uh there hasn't been a trial there's not even a trial date in it presumed innocent until proven guilty if he is convicted then the case goes to the second portion which is the sentencing portion because a jury will decide if it is uh, life and or the death penalty. The mitigation expert they're talking about will come in at that portion of the trial, not the guilt phase. She calls it the innocence phase, which I appreciate. Not the guilt phase of the trial, but the sentencing phase of the trial. So the mitigation expert is something completely different because it goes to the second half of the trial if needed, but they have to prepare the case as if he will be convicted. I'm not talking about her. She wouldn't have access to this. I'm talking about our criminal investigators dealing with the innocent space for Brian. Those are the people that I think should have access to the same materials under the same protective order. They're not doing the generations back. None of the IgG materials would be used for that part of the mitigation work. She's doing her own thing, her mitigation investigator, uh, looking backwards as she's supposed to at the things she needs to. That's not the IgG materials. So putting aside that investigator and thinking of only our criminal investigators that are going to be dealing with our innocence phase of the case. Those See? are the investigators that I'd like to have access. They're the investigators that participate in the meeting with our experts. They're the investigators that help us put the timeline together to understand different things that were happening in the case before Brian's name was ever spoken by anybody. And we're missing that big piece about why was Brian's name spoken and how, and how does that connect to the other pieces that we have? That's what our criminal well played, investigators BJ. are going to do. They are not looking at BJ, but no bear in the chat said, wait, you mean it isn't normal to be Googling things on your phone right after the conviction? C correct. That would be correct. IgG materials, if allowed, to do any of the mitigation work. That's separate and apart. So I, I want to make sure that that's really clear. Also, when we're talking about whether something is relevant or not, I think that we're thinking of the standard for information to come out in court. That's not what I'm talking about. The court found that the IgG information was material under the discovery rules to the defense and allowed us to have access to some. It's for that same purpose and under that same one. rule that we're asking the court to allow our investigators to have access to the same materials. Whether or not any of this is something that comes into the court uh, or into trial, that's a question to be answered later. I can see that's how, the question of relevance think, down the road. This is why I'm really happy to have our experts involved, but I can see if a way that there may be a motion practice that happens that relates to this. I'm bing, bing, bing. That would be the suppression motion. Not there yet. No, we're but not. That's that's where I am. Because because I, I if if you have these experts, OK, go through this. I've been through all the, this information. And so if you can go you know, using your experts and your experts kind of can tell me and state that uh, you need to investigate particular people, okay, that were involved in this, then we can have a hearing about it. That's but not what she's I'm asking not, for. I'm not quite ready to be convinced. She's not, at this point, I don't think, as, here's the judge's concern. The judge's concern is if you get, so the familial DNA will branch out into a family tree. The defense's concern is that she or her investigators might start investigating those individuals. And I don't think that's what she's asking for. I think she's teeing up the way the state did it for a potential uh, suppression motion, not for a potential 
look, the they should have investigated uh, person A, B, and C, Koberger relatives, as potentially the suspect, not Koberger. It's that without getting this information uh, from the experts that um, we're going to find some pathway, okay, that's going to be helpful to Mr. Co Koberger. If, I, I mean, so I don't know. Courtroom, so if that's what you want to do, we can. Um, I'm here. We She's, waited a while to come to this hearing. Respectfully, I'd like I'm to do it differently. I'm asking for it all with a protective order. If we do it the other way, we can do it. It's just everything takes time. And if that's the preference, that's okay. The court knows and would order us to not reach out to any of the people in this material, and we wouldn't do any of that. If we have a motion to file that references any of the content of the materials, that would be filed under seal. This, these are sealed items. If there was a hearing, I would guess the court would have a chance to look at filings before granting me a hearing and hear from the state, and that would be sealed. CH asked a great question in the chat and said, wait, it's okay for the state to do that, but not the defense. So the, the investigators at the beginning before they identify a suspect should be running down leads, but the potential pool of all of the potential IgG profiles or all of the potential G DNA profiles that might've been pulled to do this analysis aren't appropriate to run down in an investigative fashion because it's pulling potentially a larger sample size of people not involved in this at all because they didn't match. This is this is all kind of potentialities because I think what they did was grabbed the dad's DNA and then ran it through um, close familial matches to get to Brian's, but I haven't seen all the documents and I am not sure about that. That is my uh, suspicion. But what the defense can't do is say, okay, all of the potential DNA names and identifying information from all of these DNA sources are here. That's too many people to run down. If they have something specific they need to run down, they need to come to the court based on this one narrow, tiny, specific subset of discovery being turned over. So it is a very nuanced and limited question. If that helps, I'm not might be more asking confusing. our investigators have access to run out and start interviewing people. I'm asking they have access to not be shut out of conversations, considering what this means and how our client came to the attention of law enforcement and to plug things into the timeline of us trying to understand how we got from November 13th to December 29th. That, that's it, not to go out and try to talk to people. I can just see that there's a potential motion to be filed, but that wouldn't down the road be contacting anybody right. at all. That would be a motion well, for the courts. That's to reassuring. I mean, that that's one of the concerns. I mean, you know, pulling a lot of other people into the case that uh, you know are completely innocent and don't even have any connection uh, to the situation. So let me go back to Luke Jennings. Yeah, can you respond to any of this? No, oh, Your Honor, I'll just reiterate that uh, Ms. Taylor keeps discussing the their ability to just understand the timeline. Again, you're very familiar with the material. Understanding the timeline and how we got from November 13th to December 29th is all laid out in that letter. Um, none of the other materials are going to... The prosecution's like, oh, uh, it's in the FBI letter how they got from the murder happening to arresting Brian Koberger. And the defense is saying, we have a lot of questions about how you got from point A to point B. It's not just the DNA. Lots of you that have followed this case in the chat are like, hey, oh, there was other stuff. Yes, cell phone records, car, etc. But they are focused in on the um, familial DNA or the genetic genealogy DNA. So that's what they're that's what they're focused in on here. But the court doesn't want the defense looping in people who were just part of a data set, if that makes sense. Uh, and the state's like, we gave it to them. The Duh. So that's that they be given access to that, named investigators to that letter. Thank you.
She's like, they have it. The you FBI laid it remember. out. You know who doesn't have that information? Literally any of us. Wouldn't I love to see it? A few hearings uh, in the past that the state from the very beginning said they, they, there was no, that they no, uh, no, I don't know how to, I mean, it, it wasn't, when I asked them in the hearing, you know, did you use the IDG? The hearing he's talk about, I think was the second part of this hearing that was closed. Uh, any of the information at the IDG to get the warrant. Uh, to get uh, Mr. Koberger's uh, uh, DNA that was not part of it. So in terms of the time frame, don't know that it's that complicated uh, because a lot of what happened in the time, in the time frame happened before that. Now, that's up to you. Um, right. Get, She's the defense attorney. Into that, obviously, but there was a lot of information in the letter, too. Just He's seen it. Sequence, the FBI sequencing. Uh, uh, using the IGG uh, at all. So we're going to have to sort this out, obviously. That's what you're but, here to do. Um, sort it out now. Going back to what I'd like to do is just get some justification or digging in deeper, uh, if necessary. And I'm not sure it's necessary, but, you know, I, I'm going to keep it He wants to know. So, for right now, I would say, uh, let's just get your experts looking at the IGG stuff and exactly what they can read from that. And uh, we'll go from there. So he is doing okay. this step now, by step like the new kids. He wants to go, your experts get it, then we'll see if there's more, then we'll see if there's more. Um, in the chat, I saw a fantastic question. Dawn asked, are they trying to get the DNA thrown out at some point? We're going to absolutely see those motions. We might see other motions, but they're trying to lay the groundwork to make a suppression motion on the DNA because it is strong evidence against him. So yes, at some point down the road, we will absolutely see in there, we will probably see a suppression motion um, and then we will see motions in Lemonet as well. But this information, like all of this investigative DNA, the, the IgG information, will not come in at trial at all. This is very much foundational lawyering that you, if you just watched the trial, would never know all of this had happened, which is why some of the trials I cover, we start from the beginning at the arrest and follow it through. And sometimes we jump at at the point of trial and we don't know all of what has happened in the backstory with all of the motions. Here, by the time we get to the trial, we're gonna be like, well, we saw them argue this in motion and we saw them argue that in motion because we're watching all the motions at this point. With regard to your clarification, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that you, your investigators can't contact people that they've already contacted uh, without relying on the IGT information. Does that work for now? Yes, Your Honor. I, I, our mitigation expert has done her own family tree based That's on different. her work. And she has nothing to do with the IgG material. She's not an expert that would have access to that. She's not named. So she needs to keep doing what she's doing as far as her work goes. And he's not and, limiting and that at all. I think the my... proper clarification is that the IgG materials will not be used to develop any investigative leads. I think that's fair. And what uh, Ms. Jennings uh, proposed in language in their response to your motion. Um, is that something that you would object to at this point? I'm sure it, she probably read that language. I, I did read it. it Let was, her answer. It's a little bit less straightforward, but I think it covers it. It allows me to continue to speak to the people I'm speaking to and that I need to speak to that are on my list. Okay. Um, anything else about that? No, these issues. Okay, Ms. Jennings? No, okay. Great. Great. Let's move on.
What are we moving on to next, Your Honor? Okay, the next the next question I had is I know that uh, Mr. Koberger filed uh, for a permissive appeal to the Supreme Court, and I just wondered what. So he's asking them the status of the appeal to the Supreme Court. This appeal to the Supreme Court was after the judge denied the motion to dismiss the indictment and then denied the motion to reconsider his denial of dismissing the indictment. That was the um, back to the Magna Carta arguments from Mr. Longston. So the court is asking for the status on that appeal. You know about that because I have heard nothing about that. I know. Sorry to interrupt, Your Honor. This is also a hearing from when we were in trial with State versus uh, Hannah Gutierrez. So this hearing is from February 28th. So there has been an update to this. After this part of the hearing, we'll just go with the update. I know the state filed their objection, and that's the last that I recall seeing about it. Yeah. Announcer voice on March 14th, 2024, the Supreme Court denied Brian Koberger's motion to dismiss the indictment. I don't know if they denied hearing it or denied the whole motion, but it is dead in the water one way or the other. I need to pull that. I've um, only so far pulled the news reporting of it, but that has been denied um, and is not going to be moving forward. So that's where we're at with that. So at this point, we don't know if the Supreme Court uh, is going to thank you pamela it. the camel said denied hearing it okay so it's not it. happening you know anything else mr mr thompson uh, not other than the state's response was filed by the appellate division of the attorney general's office and i i think we're just waiting to hear uh from the supreme court at this point. Right. correct your honor okay. um we're just waiting to hear from the supreme court i can tell you there's no deadline in the rule for them uh they didn't include the deadline for themselves and in my experience, it can take anywhere from a couple weeks to a month or so. So at this point, we're still And that's what they did. So I don't know the answer to this. Uh, if it's filed, does that pause what we need to do here? Or no. do we just pause it only when they pick it up? Only when they pick uh, it up. My read of the rules, Your Honor, is, is the latter, that we would we continue as we are. The court's asking if the Supreme Court decides to hear it does the criminal proceedings in this case pause it's only if the supreme court decides to take it up when the supreme court says you ruled we're not touching this everything goes on as normal which is what happened are uh, unless and until they decide to take it and then they would decide at that point what exactly is paused and not okay thank you next Anything question else about that <laughs> no thank you chair. mr thompson no sir all right <laughs> I think we're now to schedule, starting with... Uh, this is what I've wanted to hear. Scheduling is the best part of all of it. Um, there was a request on change of venue, maybe late April, you were saying. Ray Brock asked a question in the chat. Is Koberger guilty? We don't know yet, Ray. We're gonna we're gonna wait and see how this trial plays out whenever this trial plays out so right now the technical answer to that is he is innocent until proven guilty and we have not gone to trial yet so at this point if one is forced to answer the 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 correct answer would be he is innocent at this stage because he has not yet been proven guilty so we will see yes your honor um either that last week of april i think it starts the 29th and 30th or the first or second week of May for the actual hearing is when we request. And we would ask that we have until maybe the second week of April to get our initial briefing in and then the state's response and our reply after that. So what are you thinking would be the, the hearing? Like um, give me a day or a week. I would say that first full week of May. A week? You want a week? A week? You want a week? A week to hear the change of venue. This is, they are just scheduling the change of venue motion. So they are asking for a week for the change of venue motion. That's a lot of fucking time. Um, 
maybe that's May 5th or May 6th. That's a lot of time. Uh, all right. I mean, go off, all I right. guess. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, and yes, today my pen is sent to me by a lovely law nerd that is all. Your, your Honor, we're asking the court to either deny the motion for change of venue is premature or to set a hearing date closer to the trial date. I mean, it is a little premature. I liked the ones we saw in um, Murdaugh better, but we'll see. When that trial date gets set. And the reason for that is when courts look to change of venue and whether or not that's appropriate, uh, the courts look to affidavits that have been filed. Um, importantly, they look to uh, what jurors say, prospective jurors say during the voir dire process. Another thing that courts look to Agreed. is the amount of media coverage and the proximity of that media coverage and the intensity of that media coverage to the trial. So in this case, the prosecution is going to use the defense's own motions against them down the road, I think, because the prosecution is going to argue the defense has said this is worldwide media. So where are you going to move it to? Where are you going to move it to? Why not here? This is worldwide media. There's nowhere you can go. And they're going to use all of that. But the change of venue motion, if they're going to set the trial for 2025, it's of people move. People come into a community. This is also a college uh, community where people are in and out. There, there's just there's just no need to do this now. I do think it's a bit premature. Uh, I, I think we, A, we don't have sufficient information to even determine whether or not that's appropriate without seeing what a prospective jurors actually say. But B, we're far enough out from trial that we can't really gauge that anyway. Uh, so we would ask, uh, we would ask the court to either deny that uh, motion at this time or to set a hearing uh, further down the road and closer to trial. If we do proceed to hearing, uh, the state would just ask for a scheduling order. At this point, uh, the defense has filed a motion. They did not file any affidavits, disclose any experts. They haven't even filed a supporting memorandum. And so we're not even sure what specific cases they're relying upon. So we can't really respond substantively to that motion. Your Honor, if they don't do their brief, work, we so can't we do ours. We set a briefing schedule as well. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Well, my, my interpretation was that they were going to give us a lot of information, uh, affidavits. Uh, maybe what we saw in the Murdaugh case when it came to a change of venue motion before Murdaugh agreed to plead all the financial crimes. So when the financial crimes were teeing up to go to trial, what we started to see in their change of venue motion was affidavits from jurors and and transcripts um not transcripts it was affidavits and like the written um responses to the juror questionnaires my brain is sometimes going well sometimes not today but the written responses from jurors and the juror questionnaires talking about how much they knew about the murdoch case and so the defense came in and was like these are all the questionnaires and this is what the jurors are saying i don't know if we have enough of a jury pool that doesn't know about this case given the murder trial and so they brought all that information into their motion, but you can only know that once um, the veneer is established, which means the greater pool of jurors and those juror questionnaires start coming back in. And that's what the um, defense is arguing. So twin mom said too much rosé EDB. That probably, that probably has a lot to do with it. I also stayed up last night to make sure my Pokemon sleep updated so I can feed my Snorlax before I went to bed. So I went to bed late. Any testimony uh, for the hearing? Is that right, Ms. Taylor? Uh, Brandon Gaines in the chat asks, is Koberger actually in the room during these proceedings? Yes, he is sitting there at the end of the table in a suit next to his attorneys. So Ann Taylor is the attorney standing up now in like the cream color jacket. And then there is an attorney in the middle in like a white uh, shirt and a black jacket. And then Koberger is at the end in a blue shirt, tie and blue jacket. Your Honor, you're right. The motion was to put everybody on notice that we'd like to have this addressed. We do intend to have a presentation for the court. We do intend to have briefing for the state. I anticipated we'd get that scheduled today, but no, I, I didn't file the motion. I filed it to put everybody on notice that it's coming and I think we need to address it. I think we need to address it before a trial setting. It doesn't make sense to set a trial, get right up to it, and then have to have everybody who's under subpoena rescheduled and have to have the public and the families of everybody 
disappointed because yeah, we're going to reset it at the last minute. Yeah, it's a so giant I think we should pain. Take care of whether or not the court should change venue sooner rather than later, especially given the length that this trial is anticipated to go, we'll need to schedule a courtroom either here or in another county in Idaho. I mean, we'll need some advance notice to get that done, but it'll take a long time to try this case. Thank you, Ms. Thank and, you, Ms. Beatty. And Your Honor, the state is asking for a briefing schedule so that we're not in a situation where the state is learning for the first time during a hearing um, what experts the defendant might be calling and what their arguments are. We would ask that all of that information- We need a briefing schedule. Prior to hearing, including the CVs of any experts that will be testifying. No surprises. Well, that's certainly what I would expect. supposed to happen. But this it, it's quite sticky, right, to think, you know, you're going to wait until uh, ready to seating the the jury. It's That's probably a how it's week normally done in this case. Your Honor, you think you think jury selection is going to take two weeks? Oh boy! Um, the way that the prosecution is laying it out is the way that it's normally done. You wait until the affidavits start coming back in not till you start questioning. And so there's like a break between when the affidavits come in and then when you pull in rounds of jurors to start questioning them like they did in Murdoch. So she's arguing that when the affidavits or the the juror questionnaires come back in, that's when you do the motion, when you see what the jurors are saying. Um, and that's the way I've seen it done too. And the judge is like, I'm kind of stuck because if we set this trial out to 2025 and we start pulling all these affidavits in like a month before the trial is set to go. And then we need to change venue. It could take another year to get a courtroom blocked out for the appropriate amount of time needed. And that sucks. Like you're ready to go to trial, you're picking a jury, and then you don't have an available courtroom for the length of this trial in another jurisdiction. So I understand why the court's concerned. Um, and then that would suck. figure out, hey, we can't find, we can't see the jury, so we have to move the trial. That could still happen, though, um, between now and time, then. How do you really know if there's some prejudice? If it's a year um, out. Without trying to see the jury. It's really a catch-22. And all of the logistical concerns that Ms. Taylor is describing are totally correct. The problem is that is what the law requires and that is what the case law says. The case law does contemplate that. So certainly it's correct to note that there, there are going to be logistical challenges to that, but that's that's what the case law requires. Um, but even if the court weren't inclined to wait until we're actually going through the voir dire process, at a minimum, uh, I think it would be appropriate for the court to look to some jury questionnaires and, and at least go through that process. Um, hold on, I was trying to pause. Dr. Butler made an interesting comment in the okay. chat saying, I don't um, understand why everyone is treating defendant like, like he's special, treat it like any other murder trial. They are treating it like any other high profile death penalty murder trial. So even though we don't cover as many of them, this is this is how the process would go in any other high profile um, death penalty case. This amount of motion work would happen. Well, this morning I was looking at State versus Haddon, where so he's there, citing case law was, about this. You're probably very familiar with that, but um, that's Court of Appeals case, uh, 2012, I believe. And uh, there was a um, request to change venue well before the trial. Uh, the judge denied that, and then uh, it came up again when they were trying to see the jury and then the judge uh, denied that at that point, but um, kind of a double step to figure out if uh, it was oh, Which is what he's going to do, right? I've been struggling with this, you know, for well, months. You're struggling so with it, Your Honor, enough. because it's too early to do this motion. You're struggling with it because it's too early, but waiting till it's the appropriate time is going to suck. So, yes, well, yes. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that one of the parties can't uh, present evidence. Um, and the standard is... Uh, watch him, watch him be like, why don't we have a hearing 
on whether or not we should have a hearing. Let's just let's just do a full hearing on when the right time to have the hearing is. I could see him do this. Nadine in the chat asks, is Koberger in custody while all this gets sorted out? Yes, he's been in custody since the day he was charged and arrested. Kind of squishy, in my opinion, but um, they can provide that kind of information well before the trial. At the same time, I want to make sure that the state has the opportunity to respond to whatever information uh, the, the Mr. Koberger is going to present. So, so now I'm scratching my head about, well, is May, first uh, week of May, is that, does that allow enough time? Is that, does that allow it enough time for you, Ms. Taylor? Your Honor, I think it does. I can present the information uh, to the state. I can have my briefing and I can have affidavits and let them know of any witness that I want to call. I can do that probably by the beginning of the second week of April. And that would give them, if we do this in May, that would give them ample time to read it over and respond to what we intend to present. Thank you. We need to make it Ms. less Dave, squishy. What are your thoughts? Your Honor, as far as the duration of time between the briefing and the hearing, the state has no concerns about that. The state would just have concerns about those factors um, that the court that the courts require us to look to um, as far as time, the timing of the hearing um, compared to the timing of trial. Um, but as far as as far as it, it, a briefing schedule prior to the hearing itself, that timeline makes sense to the state. Well, let's let's explore that just for a moment. Uh, Let's chat. Because I've been thinking about the setting of trial. Um, well, Ann Taylor is kind of smirking. I think the judge is right to say, "Let's put a pin in this squish and try to figure out when the trial is going to be, and then maybe we can work backwards to when this hearing should be." Also, for months, but I listened very carefully to Ms. Taylor. And Mr. Thompson in our last hearing, and uh, I really it wasn't clear that I'm not really happy about sending setting the, top, the uh, trial in 2025. It seems so far. Uh, judge, judge, um, I think I speak for myself and all of chat. We are also not happy about setting the case into 2025. We we are with you on this, uh, Judge Judge. We are also like this seems so far away. We agree with you, Judge Judge. No one's happy. Away now. It's not just uh, doesn't just affect Mr. Colberger and his defense, but there's a lot of other considerations. So witnesses, I victims, am families, trying to be fair. Um, and realistic, okay? About realistic is a big part of this. When we could really be ready for trial. Now we want to do it once, okay? So um, let me go first to you, Mr. Thompson, about when, I know that it's been complicated, the discovery. I mean, you have these different agencies, FBI, state police, uh, the FBI is pretty good about showing up when you got, tell them to, though. Um, Bosco Police Department, Latop County, Pullman Law Enforcement, Pennsylvania Law. Uh, law enforcement's the least of your concerns. Civilian witnesses, victims' family, regional logistics. Those are your bigger concerns. Law enforcement is very used to, hey, trial, okay, we show up. Like, that's, law enforcement is not your concern here, sir. Uh, law enforcement. Um, and I think you mentioned it's, it's hard to get all this stuff together. Um, and that is one of the things that has delayed uh, setting the trial, uh, not to mention the motions about the grand jury procedures. Uh, also I think those are done now, though, right? Issues about the investigative uh, genetic genealogy issues and um i'm kind of curious okay when do you think that you will be completely finished with providing discovery to the defense uh judge 
most current um, projection that we have would probably be at the end of the summer. Um, the majority of the discovery has been provided. That's not to say that Mr. Koberger has been able to, and his defense team been able to digest it all because it is substantial is an understatement. <laughs> Voluminous uh, is an understatement. We are still waiting by information that uh, the defense both wants and uh, and needs to have. And we will, we're going back through all this study to make sure that nothing's been overlooked. We have two members of our team, an attorney and a legal assistant, who are essentially assigned full time to that task. Um, and that's that's projecting we got from them. It could be up to six months, which would put us with uh, discovery, initial discovery, six more months with discovery completion at the end of august 1st of september of this year because well, last time you were talking about uh, august for the trial sure enough and that's what we had hoped for and when we filed our motion for uh, trial setting scheduler back in december a couple months ago we felt that was realistic and as we are looking at where we are right now i'm not sure that it is um, we know that the defense has already indicated that just on the death penalty alone, they will be filing multiple motions, any of them very lengthy. We've seen the same filings in the Nez Perce County homicide case that recently resolved. Um, those I could see taking a couple months in and of themselves to address. The uh, motions. In addition to uh, motions that actually directly relate to the merits of this trial, discovery, motions of Lindy, and that sort of thing. Um, our team met again this morning um, with uh, our, our companions uh, from the chief's office here in Moscow, and we actually have a proposal to make to the court Let us hear it. for a trial date and a scheduling order, if your honor is interested. Okay. I'm interested. Uh, I'll tell you before you, Hit before us with you it. say anything about that, yes, I was, I was uh, looking at whether or not it was realistic charlie blue in the chat asked there's really that much the digital forensics alone are over 50 terabytes of data it is a substantial amount of information and the defense has a lot of litigation um in court to go through so yeah it's a lot and when the prosecution is like i don't think we can even he's saying I don't even think we can be ready. Um, be ready by August 2024. That's where we're at. And fair, okay. You know, being trying to be compromising to some degree. Uh, I think it was uh, March 3rd, 2025. Well, Your Honor, it just happens to be in pink highlight on my ad here, March 3rd. Are we doing a magic act? It's like, well, your honor, actually, you've read my mind in pink highlighter. I have actually said March 3rd, 2025. 2025 for trial. Okay, I had no idea. <laughs> I wasn't reading your mind or anything, but I thought that's about the mid, and I remember, Ms. Taylor, that you said that would be the soonest you could be ready. And that was if everything went right from that point. And I and remember it, that and too. it has. It has. But I'll hear what their proposals are. Okay. I appreciate again Ann Taylor's response. She was asked a question and she gave her response and said, but I will wait till the prosecution finishes. Their courtroom demeanor is just so good. And the judge is so thrilled that he was like, I said March 3rd, I was right. He's thrilled he's thrilled. Look at his face. Judge Judge is thrilled. Go ahead, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Judge. Um, so we would propose that the court set March 3rd of 2025 as the start of trial. We would propose a September 6, 2024 preliminary discovery deadline that would uh, include exhibits known at that time. November 8, 2024, for the defendant's discovery deadline, that would give them a chance to respond uh, to any last minute discovery uh, that comes out from the state. It's a good amount of time. Um, February 7th of 2025 for the state uh, to uh, disclose any basically reply or rebuttal to what we've learned from the defense discovery. That would include rebuttal experts. 
uh, the defense's deadline line would also necessarily have to include their mitigation evidence. Um, we would suggest the court consider a final pretrial conference, kind of a, the pretrial wrap-up details conference for the week of February 12th to 16th, 2025. Since the death penalty related motions are already known and they aren't dependent on discovery, uh, we would ask that uh, any death penalty related motions defense have be filed by se September 6th of this year that the state have until October 11th to re respond. The defense can then reply by October 25th and schedule a hearing during the week of November 4th through the 8th of this year. So we can get that one. Hillary in the chat asked, a year from now is a speedy trial. Koberger waived his speedy trial, which is why we're still talking about this. With a death penalty case, there are competing interests here. The defense needs to um, have enough time to properly prepare and put on their case. The state needs and also has a right that the trial move forward in a speedy fashion and also has the right to not only investigate what the defense turns over, but also needs to make sure that their witnesses are still in the area, still available, that memories haven't faded. Because when this goes to trial, what we're going to see a lot of, I imagine, from the defense is, but your memory was more clear then than it is now, X, Y, Z years after this event. So the prosecution also wants to get this to trial well or before memories fade too much um, from the, the time. So this is where we're seeing this get pushed. For a death penalty case, this is not the outside boundaries of how long cases can take by any means. Is that frustrating? Sure. Um, however, they would rather have the trial done right than the defense have an appeal because they didn't have enough time after they waived time to prepare their defense adequately. A lot of so, 12, 18 hours work slow. Of, of those motions are going to be filed. I mean, get that handled. We would suggest that the court direct the jury questionnaires, if we can't agree on one, that the record suggestions uh, from the state and the defense be to the court by November 1st of this year. That would give, give the court the opportunity to finalize a jury questionnaire that the court is comfortable with, and it can be ready at the start of the next calendar year, which is when the next jury pool would be pulled or would be drawn. Uh, and the court can, at that point, um, get questionnaires out to an initial panel and can assess in a timely fashion, um, are we really going to have venue issues um, in the early part of next year as we approach March 3rd? Um, we propose the jury instructions exhibit list uh, be uh, exchanged by January 31st of 2025. And finally, as to pretrial motions, which would be case-specific motions, motions in limine and those sorts of things, the deadline for filing that that would be November 22nd of this year, with the understanding that parties could file them early. I and mean, the state already has been developing a list of various pretrial motions and limiting that they can anticipate. Like to consider yeah, they can anticipate early. most of that. But the deadline would be by uh, now. November 22nd. They should be responses able Responses by December 13th, replies by December 20th, and then schedule a hearing on any of those pretrial motions sometime during the week of January 6th through the 10th. I think you have to write that down. I, I have it all written down. We can, we can get, yes, sir. And we can get it to you in writing. That's not a problem. Okay. Ms. Taylor, so if things aren't going perfectly, of course, they never do. They never do, Judge. They never do. And I'll say it again. Death is different. This is a capital case. I've heard the court say the court only wants to do it once. I've heard the court ask, what can I do to speed things up? Um, doing it right and doing it fast in a criminal prosecution on a death penalty case with this much information are not, uh, synonymous. You are going to get one or the other. And I saw the comment go by in the chat that courts are built for distance, not speed at that's accurate. Um, the wheels of justice turn slowly. I didn't mean to pause your face like that judge judge, but she is right. I need discovery. 
I need all of the discovery. I need the things that we've asked for. I need to not have to fight in motions to compel for things that was done on behalf of the state by the FBI. That the problem here is that the prosecution is kind of fighting with the FBI over getting stuff turned over in a timely fashion. So some of this is the prosecution saying, yeah, I know we want to turn it over to you too, but the FBI isn't giving it to us. So part of this is getting delayed on the FBI end. Ends up being used against Brian or used in the investigation. I need that stuff. I need, when I ask for something, I need to get it rather than have to go back and ask and ask and ask again. And I'm not saying anything mean about Bill Thompson. I'm just not. I think he tries to. Your Honor, Santa didn't do it. We Bill's a great guy, but I think federal law enforcement is being a giant pain in the ass. That I think is what she's trying to say. Um, but yes, she is putting her foot down and saying, when I ask for shit, I need it to be turned over. And if the prosecution doesn't have it, and they have to fight for it, and I have to make motions to compel, and you have to order it so the prosecution can go to law enforcement and be like, we meant fucking now, it, it gets very frustrating. And um, as a prosecutor has been in the position where the defense is like, where is it? And you're like, I, I mean, I've gone to the station to hunt down the officer that needs to give it to me and stared at them in their eyeballs and have been like, give me the discovery. It is incredibly frustrating. The prosecution has turned over everything they have in their possession, but there are still things in possession of law enforcement that they are trying to get turned over. And they seem, the prosecution seems deeply frustrated as well. His very best, but I think he's hampered by the agencies and the information he gets from them. I can give you some examples. Yes. We ask. We love examples, Anne. T tell us what law enforcement is doing to this prosecution team. We would love to know. For x-rays. We were told they don't exist. They're listed repeatedly in reports. We asked for them again. And I'm not sure if I'm getting them or not. The response is we have thumbnails, but we haven't found the actual x-rays. There's one of them. That's odd. I asked for certain mapping data done by a member of the cast team. They said, you have it all. I said, no, I don't. I only have November 29th. And they said, oh, well, I guess we just didn't get that. Something didn't copy right. And I'm not saying anything mean about Bill or his office. I'm saying this is really difficult to drag the information out and get it, get it to my experts or to understand it. And to hear that we're going to have a discovery deadline by the end of August is great. I need to have every piece of everything. I then have to have time to double check and make sure I really got it. I need to have time to get it to my experts and for them to have an opportunity to understand how that impacts their opinions, if at all. So I'm prepared for this case. And then we need time to get things to the state and for them to respond to what we send to them too. I know that this court wants to set this trial. These kinds of cases don't happen in a year. They don't happen in two years. They take a long time. This case is challenged with the way discovery has come at us. I'll give you another example. I open up, I get them, and I list them in my computer by date. At one point, I gave the court a printout of that so the court could see how I'm getting it. And when I look in a- I can see how frustrating this would be to the defense if they're like, in this report, they keep mentioning thing A, and she's like, where's thing A? And they're like, thing A doesn't exist. She's like, bullshit, thing A doesn't exist. It's in all your reports, so where is thing A? But having to do this with 50 terabytes of data is tremendously time consuming and it's a lot of work. So I can completely understand why she's like, these are the things we're dealing with. In this one report, it says these things all over. And when I ask for those things, they're like, it eh, doesn't exist. Yeah, it has to exist somewhere. And if things are destroyed or missing or not turned over, she needs to know that too, so she can argue it in motions. Folder, it has subfolders. And I might get some reports from Moscow Police Department with an FBI report. And an FBI report might reference an email. It might reference a photograph. It might reference a screenshot of a and picture. And we don't have that. Or of a phone that they took when they interviewed somebody. That's not with it. So maybe a few months later, I get some photos that has these screenshots in. 
And now I have to try to figure out who gave that screenshot, whose phone did that come from, which officer did that interview, and get them matched up and figure out that somebody I need to talk to. So not only do we have a huge volume of information, the way I get it is completely disorganized. And it's like, if you wanted to play 52 card pickup with 100,000 decks of cards and throw them in the air, and I have to go figure out how to put them together. And by the way, the backs of every one of those cards look the same. And that's a fair analogy in a case with this much data. Uh, discovery can get turned over in a very piecemeal way. I don't think the prosecution's doing that on purpose. It does happen that way in civil cases on purpose. Sometimes in civil cases, they will bury important documents amongst voluminous documents. It happens all the time in civil discovery dumps. Um, in criminal, it just is the nature of the FBI is like, you asked for this thing three months ago, here's the thing. And then the prosecution like, here's the thing. And that's their obligation. So I, I feel for Ann Taylor in this. I really do. I feel that's for the, what I, I feel for the prosecutor in this too, because the prosecutor is getting the information the exact same way. Like they're both in the same boat. I'm doing. We also have science questions in this case. We have DNA. We have cell phone analysis. We have video analysis. You don't have a clandestine chemistry lab that though. The state really likes in this case. I don't have the full scope of that video with audio that should be available. They're working on it. They really are. I don't think they're not working on it. I'm just saying this is a real thing that takes time. And then you have the public nature. Samantha Baker in the chat asks, so the prosecution doesn't have this info already correct. The discovery that they are fighting over is discovery that law enforcement has not yet turned over to the prosecution. And so this is a fight that they are dealing with um, multiple, like the judge listed out the plethora of law enforcement agencies. And whenever you have that many agencies, things will get lost in the weeds. And one agency will be like, but the FBI needed to turn that over. And the other agency will be like, but I thought you had it and you needed to turn it over. It, I can absolutely understand the frustration. This case, and people don't want to talk to us. They're not wanting to talk to us. So we have to try to get witnesses, people that are listed in the state's discovery to talk to us. We have our duties that are required with mitigation because there's no break. I don't get to go to trial on the innocence well, phase. Well, we know that, Anne. And then if something goes wrong and Brian's not acquitted, I don't get Her language is so precise. Like, Ann Taylor is just an advocate into her bones. And you can hear it with her language in everything she does in this court. I am, I am impressed with the way that she does her job. She repeatedly calls what most call the guilt phase the innocence phase. And every time she reiterates this case, she talks about it very much from the my client is innocent standpoint and then moving forward. The languaging is very important and she is very, very clear with that languaging. And it's really just impressive to see um, the consistency for sure. Time to go prepare that medication, uh, mitigation. I have to take another breath and start right there. So I have to have time to do all of that. Our mitigation expert is working as quickly as she can. She is meeting a lot of resistance to collect records and to conduct interviews. We're working through that as best we can. She has travel obligations to try to interview people. These things take time. I want all the discovery by the end of August. I love the discovery deadline by September 6th. That does not allow me enough time to get ready for trial by March 3rd. That deadline, that cutoff for us to get mitigation materials, that, that's impossible. That's just impossible. We've got the year pretty ah. well scheduled out with what travel still needs to happen and what records still need to be obtained. So to have to have that to the state, I think they said by September, October, that that's just impossible. I would request that this court take up our venue motion in May, make a decision on venue, and Why? let's see where we can get with the discovery. I still need to read every bit of discovery that's come, and I haven't. I scan it when I get it, but to go page by page and read it and understand what it means, I'm not through 2023. I have a long ways to go. So I don't think that 
that is realistic to set it. I think if you set it for March, I'm going to be back here after the discovery deadline, and I'm going to be telling you there's no way that we're going to be ready for trial. I would rather this court set the change of venue, make that determination. Let's see where we get with the Why, discovery though? by May. Like, Anne, and I'm with you on all of this. I just don't know what the change of venue motion in May gets you. Like, I am... I am with you on all of it. I just don't know why we need to do that now. Probably the court would have a decision by the end of May, early June. Let's see where we are with discovery by then and set a realistic day. I hope we can go. Um, Aggie in the chat said, if she's a public defender, she is a public defender. Is Brian her only client right now? I certainly hope so. No, Brian would not be her only client. She would have other cases. She probably has somebody on her team, um, a legal assistant that's dedicated just to this case. There are multiple lawyers on this case, but she would very rarely get to do just one case at a time. That is definitely not how government work works. Same for the prosecution. And the prosecution made a note that they have one attorney and one assistant dedicated just to this case they noted it on the record earlier in this hearing because it's so unusual so she might not have um just one client she might have other clients but she has said that her team is working primarily on this by summer of 2025 so we're back to her saying well, this is you. why we need summer of 2025. Taylor, i um i can help in any way to speed things uh with you know. yes make reading faster <laughs> like she, she has to go through she uh, is obligated to go through all 50 terabytes of data she is the lead attorney i feel for ann taylor in this moment and there's times we were talking about this on members only last night when i say things like i just need to go through it all the legal research that i do i do myself I want to go through the court documents. I want to go through the statutes. I want to give you my interpretation and my understanding. So when um, it's like, what are we doing with um, this case or that case? And I say, I haven't had a chance to catch up yet. It's the same. It's trying to balance um, how much time there is in a day and how much, how much reading one can do in a day. You know, if there's problems with discovery, I'm so happy I feel to for do her. that on very short notice, and just so that we can keep going. Um, but you say, you know, it would be fantastic if uh, you got all the all the discovery by August. Yeah, that'd be great. Your mitigation person. Has I want to see the judge, and judges would do this on occasion. And there were times I would ask judges to do this. There are judges that will call the lead investigator in and be like okay tell 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 it to my face why the discovery is not in so if this discovery doesn't get in i can see judge judge being like bring me the fbi and let them explain to me why they're not turning it over i have questions i that would be that would be fascinating to watch already, right um and just to know that i'm not being insensitive about this i did i did i did read the uh ABA supplementary, uh, supplementary uh, guidelines for mitigation fun um, function of defense teams in death penalty cases. And it's, He's like, I've read what you're told to do for your job. It's, it's a lot. Huge. Okay. I, yeah. I get it. There, there are so many things um, that if you don't do, it's an effective assistance of counsel. As well, you were ineffective. Yes. And, it's IAC. Uh, those standards are are high standards. Yes, for sure. And it takes obviously it takes a lot of time. So, but I'm also thinking if you get all the discovery, if you can, assuming that, which will be inaccurate, uh, for the end of August. You're saying that you wouldn't be able to respond to all of that. At Greg, you can't spam the that chat. Even earlier, um, that you could not be ready for the beginning of March 2025. That's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying I love that discovery deadline. Let's shoot for that. 
and I think that would help me make a June 2025 trial. I think once we have that discovery, um, and, and I agree, we can file the challenges to the death penalty earlier, but the challenges to some of the things that are going to be contained in discovery, those, we need to see it all. And see <laughs> She's it like, having it, is, having it is step one, reading it is step two, and making sure that what we get doesn't implicate other things that we need is step three there's an absolute lot tracy in the chat said i was in a trial once where the judge actually called the person and boomed it on the speakers in court it was great i've seen that happen too where they're just like i'll let me call let me call them up and find out because when all the attorneys in court are like we're trying there's not much you can do in our place i can do some things early but i may be coming back and asking the court to reconsider if it doesn't go our way and we found something that we didn't have I think a discovery cutoff is great. And I think the court has to manage that discovery. If we finally are up to the eve of trial and there ends up being a whole new dump of discovery, then the court has to look at that discovery and understand, is it exculpatory? Is it something that we didn't have a chance to prepare for and should be excluded if it relates to the anything to do with the death penalty portion of the case? I'm just going to say, Lyndon in the chat said, the taxpayers pay for the legal system to operate as well as it can. Sometimes it's sticky. Lyndon, I would just say sometimes it is also squishy, as we have heard in this particular case, <laughs> because I couldn't help myself. Then the court's going to be asked to strike the death penalty. I mean, it, the discovery deadline is critical in this case. So I love that. I love that. What that means if I have all the discovery by the end of August this year, it means that there is a stopping point where I can know I have it all, so I can confidently get the motions filed. I can confidently tell my experts, this is it. This is the scope of what you have to do. And I can have some space to read it all and understand it and get ready for witnesses too. If the court makes that deadline, know that mitigation is not gonna be done by then, but if the court makes that discovery deadline and then we follow that with our motion practice and then our deadlines for expert disclosures and whatever's going to come from that and our mitigation we should be in good shape by june of 2025 to try the case if we have that discovery come up i think that's a great idea you guys have great questions mr thompson i'll get to them when we get to q a brian figure out where to start first yes discovery is bad um jen and georgia in the chat said what the actual hell here let me what the actual hell why doesn't she have discovery by now crime was in november 2022 law enforcement hasn't turned it all over to the prosecution yet so the prosecution hasn't turned it all over to the defense yet so that's why yes yes there have been things that uh mr coberger has asked for that we've inquired and we were initially told no you don't have that and then uh, we have gone back at the prompting of defense saying, you sure, I mean, it ought to be there. And for example, x-rays for the autopsy. Well, we just got those. The first came in. With <sighs> that would be so frustrating. Like, I feel for the prosecution. And I'm generally, because I was a prosecutor, harder on the prosecution. Like, I'm more critical of how they do their job um, than I am of defense. And I think, I wonder if defense attorneys feel the same way. I should ask Grunkle, like, are they more critical of defense because that's the job that they do? It's like, this is what I did. Be excellent. I feel for this prosecutor so much because it's so fucking frustrating when law enforcement's like, you have everything. And then the defense is like, um, sir, no. And then you go back to law enforcement and they're like, whoopsie, because the prosecution's ethical duty is to turn it all over and that includes everything in the possession of law enforcement. If the prosecution doesn't know it exists and law enforcement doesn't turn it over and it's later discovered, depending on what it is, it can overturn a conviction and it can be a huge issue for the prosecution. They are responsible for things they do not know exists. It is a very difficult position to be in and it is hard when you are dealing with one agency. It is a fucking shit show when you are dealing with seven or eight agencies across multiple different states and jurisdictions. I, I feel for all of the attorneys in this case. And I also feel for the victim's families in this case. They're like, can we go to trial, please? And the attorneys are like, uh, so here's the thing. 
this is a this discovery right now is a mess there are not always um there are not always x-rays taken at autopsies so i'm going to take a minute to talk about that there are not always auto uh x-rays taken at autopsies so it was mentioned in reports that x-rays had been taken at the autopsies and so they just turned like just turned those over here in 2024 for a crime that happened in 2022 because the prosecution asked and they were like we don't know i would imagine and this again is emily's speculation um that because this was committed with a knife there might have been a uh, bone chipping on any of the victims that would have needed to be x-rayed because it's not something that happens in every autopsy i've seen um i don't know if that's normal practice in in idaho but it would i would imagine that that's why they would do something like x-rays which is not normally done but that should have been just turned over with all the autopsy stuff like when you get the autopsy packet you should have gotten like they should have gotten everything so the fact that there's stuff that's not even in the autopsy packet means you can't trust that everything's been turned over so so frustrating so there is a lot of frustration in this case for both attorneys thumbnails in today's discovery miss taylor is going to have the full size which we were able to obtain when we saw he gave us thumbnails these are useless give us get us the real thing uh and through the coroners can you imagine being the defense attorney on this death penalty case and being like yo um there's x-rays i need you to turn them over and what they give you back is fucking thumbnails god damn the rage the you're you're gonna give me you're gonna give me the thumbnails of an x-ray you're going to give me the thumbnails of an x-ray no no you're not no you're well, not we, we were able to finally achieve that According to Ms. Jennings, we are better than 95% complete on discovery. Uh, so we're getting close. There are some things that are outstanding. Well, there's the answer, chat. 95% done with discovery. The prosecutions, they're not all the way done. Two years out. There are some issues with uh, what information is actually available to us. We have given Mr. Koberger everything that we have that we haven't asked for a protective order on or had some sort of dispute about. And we've given it to them and the, frankly, in the order it's come in, uh, instead of waiting to try to package it together and give it to them in a different format, just because they want it as quickly as possible. And I appreciate that. And we're gonna continue doing that. Um, we do, it's gonna benefit to have deadlines for everybody to have to work for here. <laughs> Uh, I don't think just setting a deadline for state's discovery does anything other uh, productive other than that initial stage. So it will um, hopefully setting a deadline for state's discovery will allow you to get into the ass of the FBI and be like, we have a deadline. And if we don't meet it in this case, gets overturned on appeal because of you, we're going to have huge fucking problems. So I need you to give me everything. So that might help. We're going to set discovery deadlines. We need a uh, state's discovery deadline. We need a defense discovery deadline within yep. a reasonable time after that and a reasonable time before trial. You need to put your foot in somebody's butt is what you need to do. Whatever the defense I'm sure he has been. <clears throat> they might be using. And then, of course, um, an opportunity after we can see what the defense is, um, is proposing or is disclosing uh, to rebut that in some fashion and give notice of that. So that package of three days are important. Um, pre-draw motion on the death penalty. I think that's important. We need deadlines so we just get it done and over with. And but what is the trial date? Prioritize based on the timelines. We know what needs to be done when. I don't know. The first thing about what's going on with defense's mitigation. Um, apparently, it's been going on for a while. It sounds like it's going to be massive. Um, that's something that we just don't have any insight to. Um, we, we think that our proposals are realistic. We appreciate the fact that something could happen where it turns out that they aren't realistic, that something happens that we have to revisit. And I think we need to be prepared to do that. Um, I think the last thing that I, I, I was to I was wondering if is, the um, Zoom buffered or if the, the prosecution buffered, like a, a what in the world? 
and set hearings on the change of venue is inadequate. As we've indicated, change of venue under the law, that motion is premature. We need to have be able to give the court the benefit of what impacts publicity, for example, is having on our actual jury pool. We know there's publicity. Everybody can agree there's been massive publicity, uh, publicity not in just in Wayne County, but I wait, counsel. Did we switch from talking about the trial date to talking about the date for the change of venue? I think we just switched tracks, but it's all been kind of getting squishy. I see more about it in Boise or hear about it from other parts of the state and what we're seeing locally. Now, so we're on the internet. We're all over. Um, so the internet at, at writ large is talking about it from multiple countries and states all over uh, the U.S. It is definitely not just a uh, Idaho, Washington, or Eastern Washington specific case by any means. The massive publicity, that's a red herring, realistically. There's publicity everywhere about this. The yep. issue Nowhere you is can whether go. the publicity and the nature of this case is such that we cannot pick a fair and impartial jury in this county. Murdoch found a jury. Depp Heard and found a jury. Of course, we know that just being aware There will always be people who just don't care about this stuff. Does not disqualify a jury. There has to be a showing that that publicity or whatever has impacted the juror to the point where that juror cannot sit in this box as a fair and impartial juror and make a decision based only on the evidence presented in this courtroom. That's the issue that your honor is going to have to decide on the change of venue question. And you can't do that based on a bunch of affidavits from experts who say, judge, there's been a lot of publicity. We that know. <laughs> He's right. So we know that, your honor. A state's discovery deadline and trying to prematurely move forward with motion for change of venue is not the right approach. We think that the out, uh, the proposals that we've made are reasonable understanding. Ms. Taylor has concerns about whether she's gonna be able to meet those. And I think there are enough stages in there that if that becomes a reality, there's the opportunity for us to discuss that. Like everybody here, we only wanna do this once. We do not want to invite error that we can avoid. I only want to do it once. I absolutely only want to do it once. I think the victim's families only want to do it once. The witnesses only want to do it once. Nobody wants to do these trials multiple times. I think though there are probably some on the internet that would love to do like Depp Heard again. I don't want to do I don't want to do that again. I it's a waste of resources. It's a waste of uh it's a waste of of court time. Um and it's a waste of money. But I think trying to do it right is absolutely what you need but i do think that the motion for change of venue is premature thanks i Thank agree you, mr thompson can i you, oh, yes, i think you said maybe you're like 98 percent uh but probably a little bit more than 95 percent is what this okay. change okay night so if it's 95 it's like are we almost I mean, there is it possible that it could be done before the end of august it's possible, and we are going to wait till the end of August to do anything. He's we like, will we're trying to disclose information as we receive it. I mean, that, <clears throat> that's not fair to the defense. That's not fair to anybody. Just sit on stuff and dump it. So we are opt We are hopeful that it'll be finished by then, but we don't want to have to face a deadline that we think there's a chance could uh, be difficult to meet. And that's why we propose this the early September date. Trish, uh, Nicholas said in the chat such a wild difference in court demeanor between these attorneys and the battle royale that occurred during the rust trial uh thank you for all that you do emily be well thank you trisha and i have seen lots in the chat mention this isn't it calmer don't you all feel like oh they are working they are working on their sides they are advocating for their sides but the adversarial process is working more smoothly yes there are hiccups yes there are frustrations in discovery but it just feels calmer and as if they have it handled this goes i think a long way too in front of jurors it is very nice to watch a court run professionally i think there were lots of quirky moments in the depp heard trial but the lawyers did try to work together the courtroom decorum is is very nice to watch though there are times that the attorneys sniping at each other in rest were amusing 
for like an internet audience. We're like, damn. But the good lawyering is so nice to watch. So nice to watch. Which be essentially six months from now. September 6th, is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Ms. Taylor, you said that would be fantastic. That would be fantastic, Your Honor. Great. And, um, Your Honor can give us a January 2025 deadline if the court wants to set a discovery deadline for us too. Uh, expert disclosures, I think maybe would take a little bit longer, maybe February 2025, the court gives us a deadline for expert disclosures. I, I wanna comment on the motion for venue change. Your Honor, because I filed a motion and the court doesn't have affidavits or the briefing to understand how we're gonna approach this doesn't make it untimely. I'm fully aware that the massive amount of media coverage by itself isn't all of it. But I'm also aware that this case has had more media coverage than most other cases and it continues. Man. So there is an impact of that. Every lawyer wants to say this and every lawyer wants to say, this case has had more media attention than most. This case has had a commensurate amount of media attention to not only other high profile cases happening in Idaho, but other high profile murder cases. It has not been, I don't think it's been more than like uh, Murdaugh. I know the Murdaugh attorneys would love it to be the trial of the century. I don't think any of these were more media attention than Debbie Heard. Do you? Chat, let me know. There are other considerations besides just the massive amount of media and an impact on potential jurors. That's what we're going to talk about. I, I think it's timely. I think it's appropriate to set a change of venue motion. I think it is what makes the most sense for the court to make that determination and set a trial date from there. If the court sets one here and has to change it later, a lot of things have gone into play to get that trial date set here, to get the courtroom reserved, and a lot of people really want waiting until the court has heard the information. Where else in Idaho are you going to go though? Media coverage. The court can make that determination. If the court agrees to change venue at that time, then it makes a lot more sense to just set that trial from there. I would think by the end of, or by Linda, May, I think we should have a hearing. I would think I would have a better hand. Oh, the media is definitely still talking about Depp v. Heard. They missed the clicks and views. They have not moved on. I wish I wish they would, but um, they definitely missed the clicks and views. That's how you know. That's how you know this case does not have as much media as Depp v. Heard, that the media won't stop talking about Depp v. Heard and keeps rehashing literally nothing new about Depp v. Heard um, because they missed the clicks and views. Like they can't, they can't just move on. So you can't, the attorneys are going to argue, of course, that their case has the most media ever in the world, but this is an ongoing case. Devi Heard has been done, like done, done, like so done. And they won't stop because they miss it. They do. They miss it. And they're going to keep trying to relitigate it. It's uh, that case is going to be relitigated on and on ad nauseum. Handle maybe on the process the state's going through now with its discovery. I will continue to make the utmost effort to get all the way through every piece of what I have now and continue to follow up with questions to the state so that we can try to have this discovery issue put aside. Once we have the discovery completed, I think that we're going to have a lot better idea of what the motion practice is gonna look like and how long that's going to take. And, and it'll be a more realistic way to disclose experts to one another with the materials that's required under Idaho Rule of Evidence 702. I, I think that's you guys are asking go, great questions. I'm holding on to a lot a of them date today because at least you'll set one that's really informed that maybe everybody can rely on. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to before Judge Judge composes his thoughts, I've seen a lot of questions um, in the chat about discovery deadlines in a criminal case like this versus a discovery cutoff in a civil case. A discovery cutoff in a civil case is like, you done. Like Nicole Breyer is standing there with the timer going, you done. Like, you know, hands down, pans up or whatever, you're done. The discovery deadline here is to make sure not only that the lawyers aren't delaying, which it doesn't seem that they are, but that there is a deadline to kind of light a fire under law enforcement to get stuff in. 
if stuff comes in later, will there be discovery sanctions for it? It's it's unlikely if it was not um, volitional. And it seems that all the discovery debates here are delay on the part of law enforcement, not delay on the part of the attorneys. So if stuff did come in later, could that still come in? Likely. It is not the same type of cutoff you see in civil, but a deadline at least gives the prosecution some weight behind leaning into law enforcement to get stuff. And it gives the defense an assurance that stuff's not going to trickle in until right before trial, which it shouldn't do. This doesn't happen in most criminal cases. In a lot of criminal cases, even in homicide cases, you, you don't have discovery wandering in a year later. This is a more unusual circumstance that stuff is still getting turned over. And that's because, um, A, you're dealing with so many agencies, stuff just hasn't gotten turned over. It's it's odd. Um, but it's it is taking quite a while, more um than most cases. Make an informed decision about changing venue. And it makes sense to me. I mean, it may be premature, but uh it I'd is. like to see what the defense has to say about that what you're going to present are you going to have a hearing um, for a hearing so, unless i'm just curious the gear yes uh i can always deny it um but if it's uh if it's sufficiently strong um and persuasive then maybe it makes sense to do that then i you know obviously when personal reasons. I don't particularly want to go to another county as you know, in 12 weeks, 14 weeks, uh, necessary. I mean, we'll do what we need to do, but I'm not, as I sit here, I'm not persuaded that we necessarily have to change it. I think that's an automatic. And there are a lot of factors, and that's one of the reasons why I was looking at this. Uh, there are a lot of factors, it's, it's and those true. factors include what jurors are saying in the jury questionnaires, Your Honor. That's why it's premature to do this now. They, that, that's sort of, sort of a key. We're, I don't often make predictions, but I feel like we're going to end up doing this change of venue motion twice. If he sets this soon, they're going to they're gonna end up doing this twice but it goes through all of the other uh, cases that have dealt in this issue. Um, so I'm thinking uh, you said mid-April that you would be able to file all of your uh, declarations, affidavits. Oh, he does set those. I knew that. Let the state know. May. I've gotten so into the hearing, I'm like, I don't know what testify, happens. If you're going to have witnesses testify, presumably experts. We got a taste of that, you know, sometime at the beginning of one of our uh, hearings. So maybe I'll hear the same witness. I don't know. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, the judge is like, let's explore together. I would love to hear it. They're going to end up doing a lot of hearings in this case. So we'll say April 17. Yes, I can make okay. that possible. And maybe we say the state has enough time to have their response. These are the deadlines for motions. I think that's appropriate, Your Honor. Thank okay. you. Because so, there may be experts on the other side, too. Really? You're you're going to start filing these motions right as the Karen Reed trial starts? Can someone consult my schedule, please? I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Um, so this motion practice is going to take place right as the Karen Reed trial is taking place with the defense motion to change venue due on April 17th. So, and I expect the information that you're going to present both sides and um you guys have great questions in the chat q a is going to be long obviously. we're just going to do it great questions in the chat we'll go over his and scheduling order we'll see the next week we'll go over his scheduling order um after this so we have all the dates so we all know
He's going through his giant death There's calendar. Other cases. Me. Surprise. <laughs> the court just made a joke. I also have other cases. Um, so he's going through his court calendar, generally the big like month by month view ones. Those are what I use too. Um, so, all right, let's see. I'm going to speed you up, Judge Judge. Where'd the audio go? And what are we talking about? Did he mute the Zoom to talk about another case? It sounds like he did. How do you feel about uh, afternoon of May 20th? That's the far out, but we've already been, been talking about maybe having a trial starting in June. So. Your Honor, uh, can I have it before May 25th? A witness I anticipate is not going to be available or starting May, May 25th. Somebody's got vacation. Starting May 25th, I think for two weeks. So if I could okay. have it ahead of May 25th, that way we can have a jury trial that week, May 20th. I'm just having a bit of flashbacks because this feels like literally how I spent half my life <laughs> sitting in court with everybody with their calendars out going, is this date good for you? No, nah, I got this thing. What about this date? No, nah, I got a trial. What about that date? No, I had a case. Sorry for DA stories. Not sorry. I had a case with um, 11 defendants, which means 11 defense attorneys, half of our hearings we're trying to schedule the next hearing. It was literally hurting cats. It felt like I had every defense attorney in the district on this case, but the, all of us with our calendars like this going, okay, when is a date? Half of your life in court, half of your life in court as an attorney is literally scheduling next dates. Worse as a civil attorney. You're like, do I need to be a member of the bar to sit here and pick dates? Today I do, today I do. It would really speed things. There has to be a better way. Someone is going to come up with a system to do this better. Um, it, it's probably chat GPT or AI, but someone is going to come up with a scheduling system to do this better and make a ton of money selling it to, to civil law firms because this takes so much court time. And in calendar calls in the morning, especially in civil, in calendar calls in the morning, I would be sitting on the phone needing a next date for two and a half hours. So a client would get billed for like two and a half hours of court time for me to sit there to get enough, another date. Oh my God. Oh my God. So much time, but, but everybody needs to, everybody needs to be on the call. Everybody needs to give notice so much time. Uh, this afternoon of May 14, give you enough time. Ms. Katie. That was May 14th, Your Honor. May 14, that's Tuesday. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, we'll say uh, about one thirty. Brandon, most Something. government agencies, I don't think, I think don't use Outlook, and this would be the problem. It would have to be something proprietary and secure. I'm just saying, there's a way to do this. There's a way to do this, but it's uh, it's quite a lot. It's quite a lot. Okay, one thirty, May 14. And people want to be heard because they want to argue over dates too. So there's that. I am going to make a determination about that presentation on change of venue before Dude. I set the trial. Yikes. Um, it could be, it could still be March 3rd or maybe beginning of June. Yeah, that's that's 2024. I know. I'm just I'm just still thinking of 2024. But it's hard. It, it, it is hard to, to think it uh, is so far out. Um, but I'm listening carefully to both sides and well, it's that's a good to know. case. And it's a death penalty case. And that adds a lot of okay, a lot of that. I we didn't use we didn't use outlook i love all of you that are like no no we use outlook 
Fantastic. Maybe they just need to get everybody on Outlook and use it. Fantastic. There's a way. You're like, the technology exists. Getting the courts to use the technology that exists. I'm I'm going to, I would like you to send me uh, your scheduling list and I will think about that. Um, We're going to have a deadline of September 6th for discovery from the state. And Ms. Taylor, could you say beginning of January? Yes. Okay, January. Give me a date. Uh, ninth. Ninth. Okay. Good. Good job. All right. And that'll be 2025. Who's baby? Or could, could we address one more deadline for you? Okay. Yes, of course. Um, uh, any, you know, any, you give, you all give me deadlines. I'll, okay. I'll write them down. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> uh, there's been an ongoing discussion beginning most recently with the state's request for scheduling order, and I believe Ms. Taylor briefly addressed it at the last hearing. There's been an ongoing discussion about the alibi deadline, and the state is asking the court to either limit the defendant to presenting evidence about the disclosure that he made related <laughs> to the alibi, which was that he was driving around the, the previous the disclosure, uh, but not allowing any further discussion or evidence of an alibi, uh, given the amount of time that has passed since the state requested that uh, alibi disclosure. Um, alternatively, since it was in the court's scheduling order initially prior to the trial getting vacated, we would ask the court to set a 10-day deadline now because that is consistent with the alibi statute. Uh, the state does not believe it is appropriate to tie the alibi to the jury trial date in this case. The statute that sets forth that 10-day timeline is completely separate from Rule 16 and other uh, discovery deadlines through the litigation process. Uh, I think at this point, there has been so much time that has passed and it has frankly causes the state great alarm that the defense is discussing calling upwards of 400 witnesses during the innocence phase when we don't. I am also alarmed. I am also alarmed that the defense is like, we have 400 witnesses. I am also alarmed. Don't have, um, potentially don't have a full alibi disclosure. And when you look at, when you look at cases uh, regarding uh, appeals from issues that arise during alibis that come up at, tri- at trial, uh, these cases are all defendants appealing a conviction because the state doesn't get a second a second chance. If the state gets ambushed at trial, that's it for us. Uh, we're asking the court to hold the defendant uh, to a fair alibi deadline, and I think that uh, the time has come. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Well, I, my understanding was, was that was it, but I may be wrong. So for those of you that weren't, um, weren't present the last time we discussed the defense's uh alibi disclosure the defense's al statutory alibi disclosure was Koberger was driving at night which is not generally a uh legally sufficient alibi disclosure a proper alibi disclosure generally includes the defendant was with xyz person and this is the alibi witness or here is the cell phone data showing this thing there it's beyond just a you know he takes drives sometimes late at night. So, because that's information that can't come into trial unless he takes the stand and then that becomes a different thing. So alibi disclosures are normally, the defendant was with this person at this place and time doing this stuff, not driving by himself at night. So the court is saying, I thought that alibi disclosure was it, is there more? And the state is saying, I think there's more. So for those of you that are like 400 witnesses WTF, the last time we did um, a Koberger hearing, I think that's when that initially came up with what Ann Taylor said that the defense anticipated 400 witnesses and all of us gasped. So I don't think the defense is going to call 400 witnesses, um, but that's what they've said. And they have the right to call all the witnesses that they list. How long is this trial going to take? I don't know. No. When the court vacated the trial setting, the court vacated all of the deadlines, including the alibi deadline that wasn't carved out as one that was still held through when the court vacated the rest of its scheduling order. So I don't think that we're foreclosed from that. The court also has the ability to give an extension besides the limited time by statute. In this case, it's more than Brian was just driving around. 
we have let the state. Tell us more. We would like to know more, Ann Taylor. We would like to know more. This is why we covered this hearing today, because we are going to learn new things, I hope. And the court know that we expect that that will be supported by expert testimony and by cross-examination of the state's experts. That's not an alibi disclosure. Expert testimony, the car, the phone, I need their full cast report and the rest of the discovery related to that before That's not I can alibi. say more about that. So to tie no. into a deadline when I don't have the rest of the discovery that I've been waiting for that would relate to that. That's just you running a defense case. That's not an alibi, but okay. That will mean that I will be back asking the court to reopen it. My expert can't finish until I get the rest of the discovery as well. And the discovery you're talking about is a video of the car? No. I am. What, what are you? What are you? No, the, <laughs> judge judges all of us. Judge judges like, can you tell me what it is? I want to know. Like, what's, what is it though? Like, I want to know more about, I want to know more about, like, what is it though? Like, and she's very careful to say, I cannot say more about that until I have this from the state. And he's like, tell me everything thank you judge judge the, the video that we talk about is one that i think the state's going to use in its case that i don't have full video on that i'm not talking about any video of brian's car when i'm talking about an alibi defense what i'm i mean unless there's video that shows it elsewhere that i haven't ma'am we're getting far afield of what an alibi defense is gotten to yet which may be possible given the fact that I, there's a lot i haven't seen yet what Fair. i'm talking about though is the cast report the drive testing information cast uh, report meaning the you know this identify identification of the particular car that is the no. cell tower oh okay. um, information so what what that is going to show and what the drive testing data is going to show and what other reports later are going to be things that my expert needs to finish our investigation and saying that I normally how that goes cross examination against the state's expert so when i'm telling you that i'm going to do those things in alibi i can't tell you more than that right now but that's how we're going to support brian's alibi that he was out driving that Okay, so you're saying that you have not received Good luck with the, that. Cell, the cell tower reports? I have some data, some cell tower data, some phone record data. I have a draft of a CAST report. The most recent information I have CAST is the FBI doing their work. The most recent information I have is that on March 31st, they expect for that report to be done through the peer review process. So I may get it a month from now. I need to get it to my expert to digest. There's so we, Your Honor, we don't know how we're going to prove what our client said, um, but we're formulating we're formulating that proof of what he said. So I'm going to need more information from the state to prove our alibi. Materials that support their report that I don't have full disclosure of. And the state's aware of it. I think they're working on it. And maybe they're on that drive that I'll pick up today, but I haven't had them yet. So, so you expect to get that in mid-March? I expect to get their report after March 31st, after it's done. The supporting data, I'm not sure when it's coming. They tell me it's coming. Okay, I'm gonna, gonna kick it back to the state. Your Honor, I'm, I guess I'm a little confused because if well, I, I, I'm, I'm saying I'm too. So, okay. okay, I'm confused. <laughs> judge, judge is like I am. I am also confusion, right? Because this is not how alibi defense disclosure works. This is not. This is just presenting your case. This is not technically alibi. So, judge, judge is like I am also confusion. Confused because <laughs> if the defendant's alibi is that he was out driving around that night. I'm not sure what additional information his cell data could add Correct. to to an actual alibi defense. It seems like what the defense is asking for, and they're being completely upfront about it, and I I appreciate that, but 
what they're asking you to do is essentially double check all the discovery before disclosing their alibi. And that's not what the purpose of an alibi deadline is. Also correct. In fact, it's quite the opposite. There's case correct. law that describes that given the ease with which a, an individual could fabricate an alibi, and certainly that's not what the state is, is accusing the defendant of doing. I'm using language that is in case law, though. See how collegial they are together? I am not accusing the defense. The case law says this. I, re I really like how these attorneys lawyer in court, but these are the arguments that were made months and months and months ago when the alibi finally got turned over, the state said, these are these are the cases. And the case law says that given the ease of manufacturing an alibi case law, we can't put this out forever. And Ann Taylor's like, I, so I'm going to need my experts to go through the cell phone data to prove what we're telling you happened, which is what they are trying to get to but they've had this argument like three times now given the ease with which an individual can fabricate an alibi that is a very legitimate deadline it's it, it's a reasonable deadline it it's locks a reasonable it in demand of the litigation process there is a reason why the reason why being the defendant knows what they were doing or not this is not a case where the defendant does not know their actions that evening so the defendant knows their action so there's nothing more they need so you just need to give us more information or not like what were you doing that night in november in 2022 you know what you were doing you've told us you were out driving anything else did you stop at a gas station and buy something do you have a receipt like anything else there is a 10-day deadline in the <clears throat> statute and that is because the defendant is able to tell his counsel where he was that night. They can work together and formulate a oh, defense. Oh, sorry. And Keep going, they Emily. Disclose an alibi. That is the whole purpose of an alibi deadline. The state look. has complied with the She's discovery. She's got it. I should have just point. let her keep going. We will continue to comply with discovery. We are disclosing everything that we have to the defense when we get it, unless there's some protective order issue. We are asking that the court hold the defense to a fair standard that has been set forth in this statute and that is constitutional under the United States Constitution and the Idaho's constitution that has been repeatedly upheld um, by the United States Supreme Court and the Idaho Supreme Court. Thank you. Okay. I maybe dropped the ball, but went through the cracks that I didn't. I guess what I I interpreted that. Judge, judge, did you just say whoopsie doodle? I really appreciate a judge that's actually willing to say this one's on me. This is why there's confusion here. Um, and Stina G in the chat said, who keeps receipts anymore? I'd be screwed. If you pay for things on like a debit card or any way other than cash, it would generally be trackable um, through through those documents, bank records or whatever, which is why we saw in other cases, people being like, um, yeah, but I just paid in cash. And then you're like, okay, well, that helps us none. So I appreciate a judge that will say, hey, this one's on me um in everything going on i lost sight of this aspect and that's why you're here frustrated as that was it for um what we were going to hear about he thought they were he done was, i appreciate that i appreciate um, his honesty uh, he was established uh you know the evidence that he was in a particular place so uh once again trying to be uh compromising which again if if he stopped at a convenience store or something to Lyndon's point, um, they would have needed to procure those cameras probably before he was even arrested because a lot of those things overwrite so quickly. Um, they would have needed to procure it before he was even arrested. So that puts him in a bit of a catch 22. I'm going to give you until April 17th. Uh, the other huh. that you everything on april 17th well maybe or, karen reed will still be in jury selection on the 17th and we'll just cover these things your time because you're going to get some additional information from fbi apparently by the FBI. Uh, march and uh we can talk more about that later at the hearing on the motion for i think the court's just like i thought that was all um, I looked at the alibi and went, lol, and, and was like, okay, you guys just do you. Um, so he's like, I thought we were done with this. Thank you.
So that gives you some cushion. You're not going to set it you know, 10, uh, 10 more days, but um, I am sending it that setting for that. And the reason for that is so you don't have an ambush. Jen, I've drive. got your question. I mean, I'll get to it at QA. That's why that is uh, established with your law. Okay. Um, Anything else? No, can't be much well, more. Well, I think we've gotten somewhere. Uh, you know what we haven't got? A trial date. And is there anything else we need to address? A trial date. Mr. Thompson? A trial date. I don't believe so, Judge. Thank and then you. I need okay, lunch. Ms. Taylor? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you all. We are adjourned. And we're adjourned. Uh, um, they still don't have a trial date. Ugh. Still no trial date. Uh, again, Miguelina, thank you for capturing that because the court does take it down like literally immediately. Let me pull up the court's scheduling order so we have all the dates. If you guys, I don't know if you care to mark your count. I do. I don't know if you would want to. And then we'll get to Q&A. We'll kind of summarize this and get to Q&A. Um, after I do the scheduling order, I'll summarize it. Let's see where that scheduling order is. Um, and then we'll do that. But you guys asked great questions. I appreciate it so much. So I'm gonna go through your questions after this and we'll do um, a bit of a Q and A on the case. And then we will wrap the long live streams, me coming back from vacation. No, no, we do two hour streams. <laughs> me coming back from vacations, the fuck we do. No, we don't. I need some lip gloss before we do this. All right, let's pull this up real quick and uh, go from there. So this is the order setting deadlines and hearing for, uh, uh, all right, my lips feel less, less naked. Based on the February 28th hearing, that's the hearing we just went through together. Any notice of defense of alibi must be filed no later than April 17th if defendant intends to offer defense of alibi and specifically defensive alibi versus uh, um, just cross-examining and just arguing to the jury, you get specific jury instructions on it. There's reasons to do this this way. The notice must comply with the code, fine. And quote, it's interesting to see the judge quote it. It's very, <sighs> you tell me what you think. I wonder if it signals a little bit how the defense feels about the driving late at night situation. The notice of defensive alibi must include, quote, or must, quote, state the specific place or places at which the defendant claims to have been at the time of the alleged offense and the names and addresses of the witnesses upon whom he intends to rely to establish such alibi. Specific place or places, names and addresses of witnesses. A hearing on defendant's motion for change of venue will be held on May 14th at 1.30 p.m. The hearing will be in person, open to the public, streamed live on the court's YouTube channel. And then the deadlines for the filings, April 17th and May 1st. The deadlines for the state's discovery to be turned over to the defense is September 6, 2024. So the court is still, it seems, workly, working loosely off of a summer 2025 trial deadline with these deadlines. They have not set that date specifically, but the court seems to be working off of, we will be somewhere spring, summer of 2025. So that's what the court seems to be working at with that discovery deadline being in September, 2025. Oh, I missed the last paragraph. The deadline for defense discovery shall be turned over to the state, including mitigation, January 9th, 2025. So they're really still working on that 2025 deadline. Uh, KFAS, is that April 2024? 20, yes. So we're going to get some stuff. Um, stuff will happen in April and May. And then we're going to get, I imagine, a lull when the discovery deadlines are happening. Unless something pops off, which, I mean, trial, always possible. So let's go ahead and summarize. The court held a hearing in Idaho on February 28th, 2024, in the Brian Koberger prosecution during the time I was covering the state versus Hannah Gutierrez. At that hearing, 
we had a lot of discussion about scheduling and some discussion about that investigative genetic genealogy DNA and who on the defense investigative team would be allowed to have it. We also heard the discovery is not done being turned over yet. This homicide happened in November 2022. We are in March of 2024 and the defense is still telling the judge we don't have all the discovery. The defense was very clear that they do not believe this is on the prosecution's part, but they believe that law enforcement is not turning things over to the prosecution, and that seems to be true, including the fact that the defense just got x-rays from the victim's autopsies, just, just. So we are still seeing discovery that is incomplete in a case that we know to have over 50 terabytes of data turned over to the defense with more coming. It has been a very complex fact discovery for both parties, and both parties seem frustrated with the time it is taking for discovery. And Taylor, uh, Brian Koberger's defense attorney made a great analogy during the hearing and said, it's like playing 52 card pickup with a thousand decks of cards and throwing them all up in the air and all the backs of the decks of cards are the same. And then we have to sort out what order they go into to analogize the amount of work that the defense is doing. We heard reiteration again that the defense intends to call maybe 400 witnesses in trial, and the defense did get a date set for a change of venue motion, arguing that the publicity in this case means the case should be moved out of Moscow, Idaho, and to another venue. That will be heard on May 14th. There was also quite a lot of discussion over Brian Koberger's alibi. Remember, he said, through lawyers, he was out driving at night. The court set another deadline for turnover of alibi defense for April 17th, saying that the defense must name the specific place or places where defendant was and the witnesses that will support that. The defense also indicated for their change of venue motion that we are going to see witnesses called. I don't know what expert witnesses are going to say with um, the cases had publicity, I, I I just, I don't know how that's going to help. I think the change of venue motion is too premature because we still don't have a trial date, but we have a discovery cutoff for defense discovery in January, 2025. It seems that the court is still working off of a spring, summer, 2025 date for trial. We heard the defense say that they do not believe they can be ready before June, July, 2025. And the prosecution say that March, 2025 might be pushing it given the amount of work that still needed to be done in this case. I think we're going to end up in that summer 2025 range for this trial. Absolutely think that's when we're going to see this trial, if not later, which is frustrating. But everyone in the courtroom reiterated they only want to do this case once. And the judge pointed out that he went back through the Idaho rules on what the ethical obligations of the defense are in a death penalty case and voiced how much the defense is required to do in a death penalty case for it not to be IAC or ineffective assistance of counsel. And the court um, acknowledged to Ann Taylor that he doesn't think she is just delaying for the sake of delay, but he understands how extensive her obligations to her client is. And again, we saw a very um, collegial, professional courtroom. Um, it will be very interesting to see these attorneys and this judge in trial because while they have shown to be fierce advocates, they have done so with the utmost professionalism and decorum. And it really is uh, nice to watch after some of the other cases that we've seen maybe go a little off the rails. Nobody's putting themselves in a box for it, uh, like Daryl Brooks, that's for sure. Let's get to your questions. I have to rearrange my screen just a little bit, but I really do. I, I really do feel for these attorneys. Like I, I feel everyone's frustration and I I did cases with voluminous discovery. I mean, boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of discovery. Not everything was digital discovery yet. Um, but I, I just can't fathom 
the teamwork it would take to try to organize and review for trial this much discovery. Sure, a lot of it's going to be video. Yes, there were a lot of law enforcement involved. So the body cam footage alone is going to be extensive. And yes, you can watch those things on screen like eight at once. I don't know if the defense will want to do that because they need to pick up on all the little nuances. And it's it's really a um, a extensive and substantial case, but it is not really just one case. It is a quadruple homicide with voluminous discovery that is high profile that is also a death penalty case. It's so much stuff. So let's get to um, your super chats, members chats. Thank yous for everyone who's gifting membership from Lacey Johnson and Niffer again to um, B2 who has gifted and continued to gift all stream B2. Thank you. Um, Troy, thank you for the gifted memberships. I absolutely appreciate it. And yes, I have grabbed member chats, super chats, and non-super chat questions to get to because I know you guys have a lot of questions and I will try to get to as many as I can. My kid's personal Uber driver, literally how I feel. Does Brian Koberger have open access to all the discovery while in jail or only in the presence of his legal team? I'm not sure what his restrictions are in jail. Um, he generally won't have things that will have witness and identifying information that could get to others. He might have limited access to a laptop where he can go and uh, use the laptop, but then go back into um, back into custody. What you don't want is discovery getting out into the custody setting by paper, but it's really going to depend on how the jail is set up in Idaho, not a jurisdiction I worked in, but it generally isn't unfettered access. Um, LMD, EDB, will you be attending CrimeCon? CrimeCon in May is here in Nashville. I don't know if I'll be attending. I have wanted to talk to the folks at CrimeCon because I would love their um, having Maya and her attorney and her family members from the Taking Care of Maya case. So I might attend to see that. But I would also, I think there's much room um, for them to bring in. They brought in a lot of podcasters, but they don't seem to even be fully aware of the uh, YouTube space, I would love to chat with them and be like, um, hi, I'm in Nashville. We we should talk, but I have not connected with them at all. Will I do a Law Nerd meetup? Yes. Do I know the date that's going to be? No. So if you are going to be in town for that event at um, the Opry, I will be doing a meetup at some time. Uh, I haven't decided when, but it will be it will be around around that time. But um, I have not been reached out to by CrimeCon, but I might go just because I would be interested in seeing uh, what Maya and her family and lawyer have to say. Um, Poot would like, why are you here? I don't know if Poot's going to be at this CrimeCon. I don't know what they're doing, but it's in May. We're in March. We'll see. Um, Aaron E., good to see you. Thank you. Prepping for four to eight inches of snow tonight. Never know. It's spring. We had the equinox. We had the equinox. Um, Indigo, I agree. This is a fantastic community. Um, Aaron said, EDB, as I recover from the worst food poisoning ever. Aaron, I am so sorry. That is that is absolutely the worst. I am sorry. Um, Rob poked the EDB and walked away. He did that last night on the members only live stream. Medicated moment. I have talked about the Scott Peterson retrial effort. It's on the Emily Show podcast, which is also on this channel. If you look at the channel, you'll see all the live streams on one tab if you're looking um, on desktop and I think also on mobile. But if you just go to my channel page, those things are all on, the podcast episodes are all on the videos because they're VODs, also on your favorite podcasting app. The live streams are separate, but I covered it on a podcast episode. So that was that. Um, Emily said, why are housewives incapable of using Uber? I literally have no idea. Um, and when they're filming, they're provided cars. Uh, let's see. Kaysenberg said they were family friends. We were floored. This happened. I, this I think is relating back to our conversations about Corey Richens. Wild. Uh, Charlotte said, can't believe it's been three years already. Charlotte, it's, it, time flies when you're having fun with the law nerds, doesn't it? We go from one trial to the next and food court to the housewives to, you know, high profile cases and time just flies. And Nancy cat has been here for 30 months. Kelly, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Kelly Ann said, just got here. Hey, Kelly Ann, good to see you. 
That was a minute ago because I've been streaming forever. Chris Bowman said the medical examiner probably found something typically cut with illicit fentanyl that pharmaceutical fentanyl wouldn't contain. Chris, that's a very, a very good deduction. That's the kind of stuff I would always ask the medical examiner to explain to me before trial. So very nice. Um, thank you, Hickers, for the gift of membership. Spiciest item you've ever seen in a search warrant. Yellow pill. I would have to think about it. I don't know. Uh, Stephen, good to see you. Literally just joined the stream and it's a media fuckery. <laughs> today, today, today we did some court coverage and some wildness. But I love that. The Dark Angel and Boop the Snoot, thank you for the gifted memberships. Lots and lots of new members today. Um, Jeremy said the letter was to mom for mom to tell brother. Thank you, Jeremy, for, uh, I think I had said it in the inverse about the walk the dog letter. We need an upcoming court docket on the app, please. Um, Mama Betts, I will make a note. I will make a note about trying to see if we can do a docket tab. Gossip rumors the gossip the rumors um thank you for the five gifted memberships i'm always going to say that in my best style of meredith marks um also a lawyer uh beck doug said my bags have been packed for idaho i cannot wait for your commentary on this i really enjoy watching the lawyers do their work in this case i feel for them this is a massive case um giselle holderness the judge in the TikTok defamation case issued a ruling is moot. What does that mean? Um, we are going to circle back to TikTok next week uh, quickly. Here's the thing. The, the prosecution, not the prosecution, the plaintiff had two different motions for summary judgment, a first motion for summary judgment and an amended motion. The judge ruled that the first motion was moot because there was an amended motion. Not a big ruling, not a big deal. Uh, pro forma just needed to happen. Kim Co and lots of you in the chat have asked if I'm covering the Karen Reed trial. I intend to. I I talked about this on the members only live um, live last night, and I'll talk about it again here. I am not going to um, do much with the Karen Reed case until it goes to trial. For those of you asking, what is Karen Reed about? And I think it's R E A D, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But what is the Karen Reed case about? Her boyfriend was a police officer in Massachusetts. They have accused her of hitting him with her car and then taking off and leaving him to die. There's a lot more to that story, and it's odd. The the brief the brief look at that case I've done, I went, oh boy, there's a lot of information here. And instead of putting it on the docket and diving into all of, there is a lot in the world of Karen Reed. I um, decided then that I was going to back up. I want to see how this plays out at trial. I don't know if I will cover any of the pretrial hearings. It's a very strange case. There are some things in that case that I am, uh, that I have questions, like a lot of questions about. So when I looked at kind of the initial overview of the case, I went, what in the fuck? And then I went, nope, I wanna wait. I wanna go in as a juror and I wanna see what the fuck is happening. So my plan is to cover that trial um, with a very brief overview of it, see what's presented to the jury. I intend then probably to go back and look at the ancillary stuff um, that may or may not come up in court because there's a lot there's a lot of sideshow in that case that's not going to come into the trial and I want to make sure that I can focus on the evidence that's presented in court and I don't want my opinion of the case to be swayed by what I know going into the case so that for me is going to take um kind of staying away from all of the an there is so much ancillary stuff no shade if you want to go into the case being like, I know everything, do do it. I want to see what's presented to the jury. And I want to um I want to see how we go based on what's presented to the jury. So hopefully that makes sense. Um and that's it. So 
that that's that's where we're at but there is there's a lot of a circus going on with that case like there's a lot there's a lot of a circus going on in that case and there are very strong feelings um on both sides of that case there's a there's a lot going on in that case so i want to see what happens in court and then maybe we will dive into after a verdict if there is a verdict then dive into the ancillary stuff because i think that's a good way of um of keeping it clean and like letting the opening statements or be like oh i didn't know that that's interesting how are they going to prove that interested to see that and take it from there that's the goal that's the that's the goal for me at this time also it gives me a little bit of time that starts um uh, mid-april it gives me a lot of time to catch up on the cases that are like backlogging so between now and then we can update on all the cases on the docket then cover the Karen Reed trial, then update the docket, then Girardi and Brittany are going to trial in May, and then this is happening in May, and then my like then my kids have shit, and then Baldwin goes to trial. It's going to be very busy with live trials here. Like we're Team Baker is bracing ourselves for how much is going to happen. Christina Lopez gifted 10 memberships. Thank you so much. Absolutely very kind. Leonard Tove said, I find it very sus that Corey's mom's partner um past suspiciously uh yeah i i do uh, it, there is su there is sussy stuff a, a, a foot there is sussy stuff afoot i can't tell whether judge judge is indecisive or thoughtful or both what do you think is his vibe common i very much like his vibe i don't think he's indecisive i think he wants to hear everybody out and i think he loves the process i think he loves um I think he loves hearing all the arguments. When you see him sitting there, he's like, no, tell me more. I want to know about this. Tell me about that. I think he's uh, I think he's here for it. I think he wants to hear everything. He wants to chat. He wants to know everything. I like his demeanor. I would say practicing in front of a judge that wants to micromanage things can be frustrating for the lawyers. I'm here for it. I like him. I, I think he loves the process and is like, tell me more about the alibi, though like tea um <laughs> i think i think he's as ready for the trial as we are um shell said toddy's trial is also in july now it's on my list to to swoop what's been going on in that case um for next week ice ice baby jen it's good to see you question maybe this is common sense question that i'm not getting never you don't need to couch your questions just ask i don't understand why lawyers acting civilly to each other is more of an anomaly than the norm what has been your experience my overall very broad generalization is that in criminal law i find that with some exceptions and tiredness and hangriness that lawyers are generally very collegial to each other they advocate vigorously for their side but they do not get personal with one another and their courtroom demeanors tend to be very good on the whole i find that civil cases tend to be much wilder there's a lot more posturing anger there's a lot more you suck emails back and forth. It's like, you were supposed to do this. You suck. I'm asking for sanctions. However, there are attorneys who are going to feel that it is their job to fight everything tooth and nail. I just find that's more common in civil than in criminal. Also remember in criminal and small jurisdictions, attorneys will have cases together nonstop. And if you are constantly fighting, it is a exhausting and be bad for the case. So most attorneys do try to get along. I wonder how much the f cases that are televised uh, exaggerate people's normal courtroom decorum. I wonder how much the cameras being present change the thing a little bit. Um, so I, I very much wonder about that. Uh, Anthony in the chat said, are you going to follow back on the Leah Bravo, Leah and Brandy versus Bravo and Andy lawsuits? Yes, I am. It is, it is on the list for a live stream. My comments just, there are so many law nerds, but the comments just like stopped for a second. So yes. Um, Seashell001 asked, will they put a limit on how long the trial will be not in criminal cases? No. Um, they will give a timeline and the limit on a 
look, if the defense attorney's like, Your Honor, we need three more days to present our defense, the judge is going to be like, uh, you have exactly four minutes and seven seconds left there. That's not going to happen like it did in the Depp case. But they do give the juries a time estimate and they clear a jury for a certain amount of time. And if you start running over that time up, uh, that time estimate, you run the very real probability of losing your jury. So if you only have a couple of alternates in a long case, maybe four, and you lose jurors, you could end up in a mistrial because you don't have enough jurors to last. So the time estimate on that is going to be um, is going to be critical to finding jurors who can serve that long, because this trial is going to be months long, like double depth v heard long. Just clear, just we're gonna clear out all of 2025. My kids are gonna be like, Mom, how's the summer? I children, I don't know. We've moved to Idaho. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. We're just moving. Um, it is going to be months of trials. Um, Danielle K in the chat asked, How long was OJ? Six months. I wonder if the Idaho case will be longer. Probably not. But things can go off the rails. Uh, Murdoch was supposed to be three weeks. Six weeks later, we were still there. It is it is probably going to be a three-month trial. Um, Garden Lover said Young Thug's trials, months and months. The Young Thug trial, I think, was estimated at 10 months, 11 months, which is why I've popped in to, and, and that was after like 11 months of jury selection, which is why I've popped in and out on that, but with seven defendants, that's seven attorneys that get to cross-examine. That case is going to take forever. And then um, people got injured, people got arrested. Like that case is wild. But without multiple defendants, it's a little bit better. Um, Caitlin Moore said, live in hometown of Karen and we all have questions. Um, Karen Reed, I would imagine. And there's a lot of questions in that case. I would ask everybody on the Karen Reed case to try when we go into trial, and I'll say this again, to try and stay, okay, this is the stuff that's happened out of trial. I'm putting it out of my brain because if you knew that you couldn't be a juror and watch it through the lens of a juror if you would like to. A change of venue motion is the change of location where the trial will be held. Yes, because it gives you a change of jury pool. They want to pick jurors from elsewhere. I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, Fiona, thank you. Sorry, EDB. Patty, no need to apologize, but Depp needs a new trial versus the Sun UK. Depp's not going to get a new trial versus the Sun UK. That ship has sailed. It's been denied and it is done, done. He asked and they said, not going to happen. So not, there is no legal process for which or with which that can happen. The legal process is exhausted. Yellow Pill said, what details do you remember about University of Virginia? I'm sure the locals will never forget, but over time, the rest of the world has moved on. Yellow Pill, that is a fantastic point. Um, and there, when we talk about memories fading as trials get further and further in the past, percipient witnesses who witness a traumatic thing, their memory will be different and, and potentially be anchored differently in memory than law enforcement witnesses who have worked lots of cases since then. What I will say is in this jurisdiction, this case seems to be a little bit more of an anomaly. Oh, Dr. Butler in the chat reminded me, OJ was nine months, not six. That's on me. I, I In my brain, it's lodged at six. Nine is, it, all of it was exhausting. It felt like it went on forever. But with law enforcement, I mean, this would happen in LA with um, homicide cases just because the homicide rate is different and somewhere in Los Angeles County than in Moscow, Idaho. Law enforcement would be like, you know, since the time this case happened, if it gets put out, I have handled 20 plus other homicide cases. So you need your reports because otherwise they kind of run together. Um, this case being a quadruple homicide is probably going to be a bit more unique um, to law enforcement because it is kind of an anomaly. It seems like an anomaly in the area. Uh, so uh, ADHD side note, Kayla always video idea for silly members only tier ranking the chairs of the judges and trials covered mods, make a note. I love it. We will tier, we will absolutely tier list the judges chairs. I, I don't, I think it's unfair though, because judge Newman, <laughs> but we'll try, I will try to tier list it like a real streamer. 
Becca writes, uh, says, is it a bad look for the state? And it's a bad look in the state, for my opinion, to be handling the evidence this way. Such an important case seems unprofessional. Um, not, not the state's fault in this case. I understand the perception and it's a completely fair opinion and perception, not the state's fault in this case. Angie said, well, the one thing BK can never argue in an appeal is ineffective counsel because Ann Taylor is anything but ineffective. Ann Taylor's great. I really enjoy watching her in trial. I like her, or I really can't wait to watch her in trial. I like her demeanor. I like, um, I like how she presents her arguments. I like how she is amenable where she can be and firm where she is unwilling to be amenable, which is completely fair. I, ju I just, I'm a stan. I really like the way Ann Taylor does her job quite a lot. And we've seen more of her than the prosecution. So far, I've liked the way the prosecution has responded to things too. Um, we've gotten a little bit of sassiness in some of the filings, but it's all been very professional and I do like them. Nicola MC asked, do public defenders get paid in line with prosecutors? Nicola, I can only speak to my own experience, but oftentimes, and where I worked, they were scaled the same and scaled like um, military pay scale. So you get hired at this date at this job entry level and the pay scales are just set government pay scales. So as you move up like job rank, your pay scale moves up. So a, uh, you know, grade one first year DA and a grade one first year public defender would be paid the same. And then as you progress through the office, those pays will be commensurate until you get promoted to other levels. And then those pays would be commensurate. So generally, yes, is every jurisdiction in the US that way? I don't know. It seems like it uh, wouldn't be that far off because they are government attorneys just on different sides. Valerie said, could her insisting on change of venue be another way to delay? Valerie, I don't think so, because if it was another way to delay, we would um, see Ann Taylor being okay with it getting pushed off. So then she would say, yeah, let's do it or in Vaudier. She wants to be heard sooner than that. I don't think it's delay um, at all. Karen 63, I think I pronounced that properly. Um, if there's so much evidence missing, how was he even arrested for the crime? There's discovery that has not been turned over, which is not commensurate with evidence missing. I realize that's me being a picky lawyer. I did go through the probable cause affidavit. He was arrested on the probable cause affidavit. The standard of probable cause and beyond a reasonable doubt are quite different. I didn't I didn't look at the probable cause affidavit and go, well, how did you issue an arrest warrant here? I looked at the probable cause affidavit and went, seems like probable cause to me. So I have coverage of that affidavit and what they were basing it off. So much else in this case has been sealed. We don't know quite a lot more. Um, plant hoarder, plant hoarder said, everyone I know here has heard about it in Southern Idaho. Remember that a jury hearing about a case and being biased in a case or swayed in a case or unable to be unbiased in a case are different things. If you heard that this case happened, that's very different than if you've, uh, joined reddits listened to every podcast watched every stream all the things very different so hearing about it doesn't disqualify a juror janelle vargas asked is ann taylor working pro bono emily thanks no she gets paid by the state of idaho she is a uh public defender so uh can we send an amicus brief to the judge to keep vod rachel no we're we're like a documentary film crew we do not intercede um, but we've sorted out a system to do it. So it's fine. So we're, we're good. It, it was just the first one that was surprising. Now we know Tina KS Leonard said, does judge judge stay with the case? If the defense changes venue, it generally goes jurisdiction by jurisdiction, but generally, yes. What would happen in a given case? I can't say until we see it, but generally the judge will stay with it. So, um, Bart Ozy. Question, if the defendant is ultimately found not guilty, do they get compensation for quote unquote time lost in custody? No, and I saw that question a couple times in the chat. No, they don't. That is why there is a procedure for probable cause, an indictment or a preliminary hearing. That first stage of a case is to ensure that a person is not either being held in custody or is not being um, under the weight of prosecution without 
just cause. So no, they do not. If the venue changes, will there be a new judge? I think I just answered that. Yellow Pill said locals aren't going to forget this case as soon as the rest of the world. It will probably come up during every discussion between a student and parents if they want to live off campus, stay out later, et cetera. It, it absolutely might. It absolutely might. Um, let's see. Catherine says she always sounds like she's stalling regarding Ann Taylor. Ann Taylor has a, 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 a mountain of evidence to go through or a mountain of discovery to go through. So I can understand that. Um, Daniela Kay said, did Brian Koberger even fight to get bail? I don't recall that part of the case. I, I don't remember if they ever made much more of a motion for bail other than the court setting no bail because it's a death penalty quadruple homicide. It, it would have been a kind of futile argument. Um, so question if Brian Koberger admitted to his lawyer that he killed them, would she still have to defend him as innocent? Michelle, that is the crux of being a defense attorney. It is your job to ensure that the state and feel free to ask a defense attorney. I've never worked as a defense attorney. Um, but it is their job to ensure that the state convicts someone off of proper evidence and that it is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So the defense attorneys can know all kinds of stuff. It is their duty and obligation to vigorously defend their client, no matter what they know. There are only very little, like if a defendant is going to commit a future crime or something, there are only little, little quirks to that. But generally, you know, a defendant can safely tell their defense attorney everything and their defense attorney can still vigorously defend them and ensure their due process. So that, um, let's see. Steel City asked a, asked a question that is, it might seem uh, counterintuitive. Question, how can the prosecution be held responsible for quote unquote evidence they do not know about? It is their job. So one could imagine an unethical prosecutor saying, Your Honor, I said, didn't this happen in the Duke lacrosse case? Your Honor, we didn't know. about the, I didn't know about that. I think they actually fabricated uh, evidence in that case and more. But you could see a case where a prosecutor could, in theory, say, well, law enforcement didn't tell us. How are we to know? What you can't have is like willful blindness to evidence. So the ethical rule and the legal obligation of prosecutors is that they are responsible for the entire prosecutorial team, which includes law enforcement. And it incentivizes the prosecutor to make sure that they have run down all evidence, whether exculpatory or not, for the case. Because you never want a situation where they can just be like, oops, we didn't know, so we don't have to turn it over. Because what happens if law enforcement willfully withholds things to not turn over to the prosecutor, then what? So yes, the prosecution is responsible for evidence they do not know about. It is their job to find out about it. If you don't know about it, you got to get about it and find out about it. Um, Des the Pleb, good to see you. Renee A said, why does this trial seem to be taking longer to get all their evidence and what they need than other trials we've watched? It's a more substantial evidentiary case than other trials we've watched. Also, Renee, we started on this channel at the very beginning when the um, probable cause affidavit and arrest happened. So we've watched this case from the very beginning. With Depp Heard, there were years of litigation before that went to trial that I didn't cover. Um, I covered very briefly the ruling in the UK, and then we just jumped into the trial. Brooks, we just jumped into the trial. Um, and others, we've kind of jumped in. Murdaugh, we were like, Murdaugh, we jumped in when he got, um, before he got arrested for murder because it was so weird and there was financial crimes. <laughs> I love a financial crime. So Murdaugh, we jumped in, but then he didn't waive time. So that case zoomed, zoomed because he didn't waive time. This is one of the first cases we've, I've started covering at the time of arrest all the way through and the defendant didn't waive time. So um, I see requests for a discord in the chat. We are working on a discord like situation in the app. So I, but I am not doing a discord. It 
it's a whole other thing. My goal for the Law Nerds is for the app to be your one-stop place for all things Law Nerd. That is my goal. I do not want any of you to have to download any other shit. It's like Law Nerds live in the Law Nerd app. I mean, we live on the internet, but Law Nerds live in the Law Nerd app and we just go to the Law Nerd app and we can see if we're live and we can see what the community's up to. And maybe we have a tab for the docket and we can see what's going on. It's just in one place. I hate having all kinds of different apps. And personally, Discord confuses the fuck out of me and I don't like it. So I wanna build my own thing that's easier. And that's what we're doing with the app. So if you don't have the app, um, go ahead and download the app. So um, I will, apps, J. Michael, I will absolutely, that is the goal. Uh, J. Michael said, let us know when we can drop the Patreon. We We are working on a way to move everyone over. We will talk about it when it is ready, but that is, the team is actively working on that. So um, that's what we're doing. Ted said, Discord is easy, but it takes getting used to. I work in Slack so much. Like it seems like a lot to have, for me to have like Slack and Discord and my email and the Law Nerd app and you, I want life to be simple and I'm trying to simplify it for you. So our own app is going to be that simplification for me and for you. Kelly said, question, how do they select a jury for cases that are this high profile? Wouldn't they struggle to find people who haven't heard of the case in the jurisdiction? Hearing of the case is okay. Too much information about the case, not okay. And they have done it in every other case we've watched. Celtic Moon said, Emily, you're in the new Johnny Depp documentary on Netflix. Is there a new one, chat? Or is this, or Celtic Moon, no shade. If you're just discovering there was an old one, did they do another one? Also, Netflix, I talked about it in the podcast ages ago um because netflix never asked me but i don't is there a new one i don't know if there's a new one i've been trying to catch up on vpr and the beverly hills reunion so i don't i don't know that there's a new one um so i don't i don't know anything about that Uh, would i be shocked if they just keep trying to like go back to that well no but has netflix nothing else to do um I don't know. Sappy in the chat said, I was so annoyed about how Netflix portrayed YouTube creators. Mm-hmm. Netflix knows. Netflix knows who it is. Uh, Trina said, could there be a question of it being his DNA? He is a strict vegan. I don't know. I, I Trina, I don't know. I don't think there's a question of it being his DNA. We haven't seen those arguments. So I, I, so I don't know. Um, Nana said, we'll be flying to Idaho, then unpacking and then staying in a long-term rental. Ashley said, the first thing under this video is news about Charlie Adelson being removed from general population. (laughs) Emily is the algorithm. Now your algorithm is going to be filled with court stuff. Um, that can happen for a number of reasons. It's not, it happens off and on with people. You normally don't hear about it because it's, um, it's, it's so prevalent and you're not following the cases along. Um, Mander said, question, Emily, I sent you a Java sock. Mander, I got the Java sock. I took pictures. It came, I got to the PO box right before I went on vacation. I took it on vacation with me. I absolutely love it. I have it. It matches. Um, it's in my car cause I use it in the car so much, but I will bring it in. I took pictures of it to share on Insta. So yes, I got it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's, I didn't even know they existed. They're perfect. Um, they're great. Michael J. Money, I am not a cat. Michael J. Money is a cat. Why would the state fight giving the defense access? They're not. If it's all above the bar and they want an honest trial, shouldn't they be sharing any evidence? They are. And I hope as the hearing went on, it became clear that the state and law enforcement are having some issues getting everything turned over. Kaylin, I agree with you that Netflix sees YouTube creators as competition. When you look at a YouTube creator, I mean, are, are we the biggest YouTube creator on the YouTube platform? No. Are we going to be one of the biggest legal creators on the platform? Yes. Um, do I see where other legal platforms on the platform get a little bit like, what are these creators doing? Yes. But when you look at a creator like a Mr. Beast, who is arguably the most subscribed to creator, I think more so than Coco Melon across channels, the most subscribed to creator on the platform. And you look at him garnering on some videos, hundreds of millions of views, hundreds of millions of views. 
he absolutely is competition for every streaming service. So yeah, I think they don't understand. And also I think legacy media, not the individuals involved, the corporate, the corporate legacy media and even legacy streaming is like, it is very expensive for us to run what we do. Yeah, it is. Um, you could do it differently. Like you could produce things differently. I think though, Mr. B said that he spends three to $5 million to produce a video. I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to law school and over 10 years of my life working in court. I mean, there's a cost to that as well before I bought a microphone and a camera and some lights to sit down and talk to y'all. But I think they are unwilling to shift the way they do things. And they are frustrated that I can sit down and have members and sponsors support this channel the way that they have subscribers and sponsors support Netflix, and it can be direct competition. Then you see news media like uh, JB Buno over at WFLA creating the Stream Center and blending together traditional news reporting with streaming. And that, I think, is a really incredible thing and a way to look at how things are going forward. So yeah, I can, I can absolutely see that, but I think there's also this um, perception depending on uh, who's making the video where they will look at content creators and be like, who the fuck are these randos on the internet that just get to grab attention? And they're like, Ugh. Ugh. and so they uh, very much look down their nose at content creators, which I find to be hilarious but that's just my that's just my uh perception of the thing maybe right maybe wrong but i think it's why they um they portray content creators a certain way it's a very it's a very kind of uh, elite kind of a thing it's just like ugh, content creators yes content creators we have sponsors too like today's stream sponsor Love and pies. Yellow pill, she only named female type of relatives. I didn't catch that in the hearing, so I will go back and listen to it. Um, Tina K. S. Lawner, thank you, Emily. I've enjoyed you in this community. Everyone is bay. Chad is absolutely bay. Don't try to, <laughs> Lizzie H is trying to watch me at 1.25. Don't, I've been Zoom Zooming. Polyester, <laughs> Esther, we're going with that. After all the wild stuff we've seen, is this demeanor more representative of how court usually goes? Yes. Um, I think the attorneys in Idaho are very representative of a well-run courtroom with professional, respectful attorneys. Um, Jicky in the chat asked, isn't Ann Taylor also involved in the professor's case? I can't recall. No, she is not. She is a criminal defense attorney. Samantha said, do defendants tell their lawyers the truth? Smart ones do. Um... Bun said, has Corey's trial been scheduled? No. Will you be gavel to gavel? I hope so, but we'll cover the preliminary hearing in May. I'm very excited. Motion to make Judge 2 official moniker of Judge John Judge. <laughs> judge squared. I, I mean, I think we can. Question, what or who is protected by the protective order? OBG, this goes back to what was happening during the IgG. The protective order protects the release of information, including personal identifying information from those that are not related to the case that might've been part of the data set from being disclosed outside of the absolute necessary individuals. So the, the investigators for the defense and the, um, and the prosecution investigators and what have you. So it's limiting how that information can be shared. Um, Aaron said, please check Delphi evidence. Other people at crime scene during murders, judge denied defense money for experts. And she said no transcript from the last hearing. There's been a lot of weird shit happening in the Delphi case. I have not had a chance to peek in, but it is on my radar to peek in on the legal fuckery that may be afoot. Even if I don't cover that case, when it goes to trial, I am, I am interested in the legal fuckery. There's a lot happening. So I've been keeping it in the background. Um, 
Jenny said, I'm having major surgery on April 11th and need all the things to watch with you for my month plus recovery at home. Jenny, I'm sure it will go all well. And it seems that we will be here for all of April. Um, Amy said, thank you, Emily, for making law understandable. I love doing it. That's my job. So I'm, I'm happy to do it. I'm going to see if there's a few more questions to zoom, zoom. Oh my God. It's four hours. Um, Cleopatra question. Have you watched quiet on the set? Drake bell thoughts. Haven't watched it. Can't give you thoughts. Um, sorry, still behind on reality TV. I've been working on catching up for, um, for the next week's podcast. Next week's podcast has been quite a lot of, of work. Um, K Rab JB has been successful pulling in YouTube audience by having you and Peter. I also think JB does a good job of breaking down the news and including the audience. Some news, and this is not most, but some feels like they are either lecturing or talking down to the audience. JB brings the audience in to have a conversation and keeps it very factual and non-sensationalized. I watched a more legacy media legal uh, commentator coverage of uh, Riley, the the missing young man uh, here in Nashville, and I had to turn it off. It was so hyper sensationalized. I was like, I, I can't engage in content like this anymore. And it was not um, a traditional creator. It was a legacy uh, media personality. And I was just, ugh. so I really enjoy the way that JB brings the community into talking about the news while keeping it factually grounded, answering people's questions. And I think it goes a long way um, I think it goes a long way. There is tea being spilled in the chat. What, what, it, what? <laughs> Small Xerone said, found out my bosses were sleeping together yesterday. This is, this is all of the tea. Uh, I hope that you and your coworkers have talked about all of it. I hope no one is negatively impacted and that this is workplace tea and, and nothing wild. I, I, wow, just wow. The chat is invested now. You don't have to say where you work. Please don't. But the chat's now invested in the tea. That's a lot to process. Um, there were days, there was one, there was one when we found out one of the defense attorneys in our building was having an affair with her boss, like in government agencies, sometimes there can be a lot of bosses. And it was like the boss, boss, bossy boss, like the uh, boss, boss, bossy boss. And it all blew up in the courthouse and she had called the boss boss bossy boss's wife and the whole courthouse was like oh, what the fuck is going on it was no one really got anything done that day because we were like oh my god this oh my god that what is going on what did you hear is this true is this is it verified wait she left work she walked out of court and left work did she get called downtown by her bosses like oh, what is happening and so um yes <laughs> we're, we're invested tea is being spilled in the chat we're invested Octo, good to see you, friend. We're wrapping up. Did you come in to tell me that I needed to wrap up and eat lunch? Do I have meetings this afternoon that I forgot about? I hope not. Do I have meetings? I don't have meetings. What have I missed? Lunch and prepping for the podcast. When I'm not sleeping and I'm prepping for the podcast, <laughs> you will know because we have so much to do for the Baldwin deep dive. Like 700 pages of stuff. I have to go read it. I actually got a new little holder for my iPad so I could highlight without holding my iPad Pro. Highlight. We've got things to do. I need to go eat. Um, Octo, everyone's getting your book delivered. They've been talking about it in the chat all day. So it's good to see you, friend. I need to start wrapping up. Um, so <laughs> CS Tears says, mischief is marrying her peer boss. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't really know about any of that. Um, <laughs> so peers are not necessarily bosses. Um, Octo said, oh my God, yes, you all have made me number one. In like all of the categories, we can't wait till you hit the New York Times bestseller list next week. We'll have to decide how we're celebrating. Um, we'll have to decide how we're celebrating. For those of you in the chat that are like JB who, Hey JB is the streaming um, interactive news reporter on WFLA. He covers national news and local news to Florida. I found WFLA through their coverage of the Petito Laundry case. 
And I think that's how a lot of us found them. And I think they did a great job of news coverage for the internet in an ethical way. And I love that. So he's been covering all the things. So you'll see him in the streaming center. Um, he's also just an awesome dude. So I really, I really like JB. One of these days we will all meet in person. Maybe JB will come to crime con and we'll get to have a whole, whole, uh, a whole meetup with everybody. That'd be fun. I'm trying to persuade other people to come to Nashville. I'm like, come to Nashville. It'll be fun. <laughs> so that'll be end of May. Um, I will let you know when we pick a date. And with that, Law Nerds, um, Octo, thank you for sharing the link. That's my Amazon affiliate link. Because yes, I'm the type of friend that if I'm going to share your book, when I share the link properly, <laughs> it will be my own Amazon affiliate link. And then I will use that money to buy Octo drinks um, the next time we see each other in person. <laughs> So, uh, let's see what is written in the blue frame behind you. I bet that I bet some of the chat knows, so I'm going to give them, um, an, a moment, a moment. Uh, the theater doc said, remind them of the Taco Bell bars. Oh no, it's, it's where I take people. So look, when people ask me things like, where should I take people in Nashville? There are a few places I really like, um, but the boozy taco bell cantina on broadway is one of my favorites and so if people are looking for like bougie things to do in nashville i'm not always good at that because i freaking love the boozy taco bell <laughs> so much i love it so much so yes it's one of the things you need to do especially if you um if you have never done a boozy broadway cantina because a i will fight you that there are few better drunk foods than Taco Bell, and B, boozy Taco Bell is delightful. Brian F., this is fantastic news. Brian F. said they just opened one of the boozy Taco Bells. I think they're called Taco Bell Cantinas. There's one in Vegas, too. In downtown Indianapolis, I haven't been yet. Look, Brian, I will be in Indianapolis for a thing with my kid, and I was told we were going to be in Indianapolis, and I was so excited. And then we got the information. I am going to be more than an hour outside of Indianapolis. I'm like, that is not the same. Like an hour and a half out of Indianapolis is not me in Indianapolis. So, so while my kid is at his thing, I will have to be driving into Indianapolis, but then I will not be boozy Taco Belling as driving. But boozy Taco Bell is the best. L. Lambert is like, girl, what the fuck? Um, that's not what L. Lambert said. Boozy Taco Bell question mark. I, I am I am going to go see Peter. Um, so the Taco Bell cantinas will serve alcohol in the, um, what are the Taco Bell slushy things called? The Taco Bell slushies. They will mix those, which are, I love a boozy slushy. Um, we'll mix those and we'll make other mixed drinks to go along with your Taco Bell. And the one in, um, the one in Nashville also has live music. The last time we were there, there was a really uh, delightful young man who sounded just like Garth Brooks. He was so good. So it was delightful. The yes, you can get booze in your Baja Blast, but there's, I don't know what they're, they have different flavors of their like frozen smoothies. I don't know. It's, it's not froze, but it is. All right. With all the freezes, Emily, it's a frozen drink. It's called a freeze. It, and at three hours, sorry, four hours, <laughs> it's time to end the stream. ADB, Judge Boyce, which which Judge Boyce? I don't know who Judge Boyce is. I see you guys trying to taunt me into um, streaming forever. I don't know which, which Judge Judge Boyce is, but we will take a look. If there's something urgent, everybody needs a lunch break, and I have to go pick up some things, but I will go take a look. Law nerds, it's amazing to see you. Um... Download the app, Nanner. We will put the Amazon link in the description. Absolutely, we will. Um, the Opry has lots of restaurants, and I will see. We maybe we'll do the meetup in the Opry. Maybe we'll do it off property. The Opry can be kind of a a pain uh, to get into. So, oh, you need to tell us. I thought the chat said it says hello, sweetie. It's a it's a it's a, a Doctor Who reference, but it says hello, sweetie, and then the little the little bit under it is a TARDIS. So it is a river song, a river song reference. Um, all right. With all of that, 
Download the app. We will see if we can make a docketed section of the app. I I will have to ask. I, I, I do not get to make things on the app. And with all of that, I will see you guys in the next one. Um, I will not be on social much this weekend because I will be prepping for next week's podcast. I have a ton of reading I have to do for the Baldwin stuff. Stay tuned in the app if anything pops off. Um, it's rare that we do an emergency live, but the app will be the place to let you know that. And I will see you on Tuesday. It is my intention to zoom zoom through some of the cases we're behind on because the podcast is going to be a deep dive on Baldwin. I don't know if that's going to be a one part or two part episode, depending on how much information there is, because I want to go through all 700 pages of that latest motion and give you all the info. Because I think um, as we run up, the Baldwin case is one of those cases where there's no time waived, but we're going to cover it from the re-indictment all the way through. And I'm very curious. So goosebump, it is my hope that we will get back to Remini uh, next week on the stream. We have some housewife stuff we need to get to on the stream. So that is the goal. With all of that, I will see you in the next one. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the app store for Lawnerd. You can also follow me around social media. And don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a law nerd.